I'm not sure what I wish to gain from this, other than potential insights from what actually happened here. This is something I've never forgotten, all the feelings associated with it, and I want to hear if anyone has ever experienced anything similar. This is my earliest childhood memory. I don't know the exact age I was, but it's one of the few memories I'm able to recall from my childhood as early as I possibly can. I remember waking up next to myself in bed. It felt like I was in complete and total control of my body, totally aware and conscious. I recall being extremely confused and worried about what was happening and stepping out of bed. I'm unsure of what my motive was, but I like to assume it was probably to go and wake my mom up out of concern. Now, this is the part that has never left me. I feel as if I can put myself back in the situation and see it just as clearly as I did when I was a child. As I went toward my door, I turned back to see a tin garbage bin at the end of my bed. The lid started to move and an illuminated fiery orange figure started to crawl out of it. It looked like it was made out of magma or a personified fire. I remember screaming, but there was no sound to it, which scared me even more. I ran out of my room and down my stairs. When I looked out at these windows that surrounded the front door of my old house, I saw what looked like an animal, more specifically a dog. It was completely white and had yellow eyes and it was staring back at me through the glass. I completely remember how I reacted to this with genuine panic and fear. I ran back up the stairs and felt like crying, but I couldn't. I was only able to hear my own thoughts and was unable to make noises. The environment around me, my house, was however, it was actually very vocal. I recall the noises of my stairs and the sound of what garbage made out of tin would actually sound like shuffling around, constantly. The ending makes no sense at all to me. I was at the end of the hallway facing my room after running back up the stairs and saw the garbage monster thing struggling to leave my room. Everything was almost completely dark around it and I swear it's like I can relive seeing how the monster itself illuminated the furniture it was close to just like how a fire or flame would in a dark room. I clearly remember hearing, it's not real. This was the voice of my mother who was asleep. When this happened, a dream catcher I had hanging in the corner of my room began to consume everything around me. My memory of this part is not as clear as the rest of the dream or experience, but I remember there being light, with the centre focus being the dream catcher. I'm unsure of what happened at the end of all this, I do not remember waking up or anything at all related to the event from that point forward. The only thing I can recall afterward is the feeling of knowing it wasn't actually real and that it was a dream. From what I believe, I'm confident this was some sort of out of body experience or a lucid dream. However, I also firmly believe that this was the first experience I ever had with feeling raw, genuine terror. There has never been a time I can recall such feelings of intense fear other than this incident, from whatever age I was when this occurred. I'm now 21 years old, and I've absolutely encountered the feeling of fear many different times, some of which where my life was actually in danger. But nothing has ever felt as intense as I did in this dream. I think that's why it's never left my memory. I just want to know what some of you think, because I'm unsure of what to make of any of this. Just now, I completely just saw a man in my living room. I was crying in my room because of something going on in my life, and I went downstairs to get water. I felt like somebody else was in the living room, like another person was just there with me. My initial thought was my dad, because he usually wakes up at absurd times because of his sleep apnea. I walked into the room and saw somebody staring at me. I thought it was my dad at first, but when I focused a little harder in the dark, it was not. I blinked and he wasn't there anymore. I got so stuck to my stomach and literally just ran away. I ran into my room and I cannot stop shaking. I'm so afraid of what just happened. This isn't even the first time this has happened. A few months ago, while I was alone at home for the week, I thought somebody broke in. From my room upstairs, I heard my dog barking. 
I thought he needed to go outside, and when I went to let him out, out of the corner of my eye, I saw and heard a kitchen chair move. My, go my dog started screaming, barking at it, totally freaking out. While I was standing there in the state of frozen shock, both TVs turned on at the same time. I freaked out and made a sprint for my keys on the table, got in my car and called my parents, sobbing. I wanted them to check the cameras before I called 911, and they told me they saw nothing on them. They thought I was being dramatic, and do not believe the full extent of my explanation that this chair had moved out from the table by itself. Aside from that, and what just happened not even an hour ago to me, smaller things happened to me too. A light in my room that has never once flickered started rapidly flickering, turned off, then back on again a few days ago. A door slammed in my face by itself not too long ago. Things are always being misplaced, lost, or randomly turning up after not being able to find it for a long time. Sometimes, I think I can see someone or something move out of the corner of my eye. I get these random feelings that someone is looking at me or in the room with me when I'm alone, usually accompanied by full body chills and goosebumps. At times, I've heard fully audible words. The night terrors are so unbearable to the point where I avoid going to sleep. Waking up screaming is a common thing for me and my parents have run into my room to wake me up countless times. These are all recent, occurring within the past six months, but I'm often told by my parents that I used to talk to my dead grandfather, who I never met as a young kid. I was too young for me to have any current memory of it today. They say that I used to say I have a friend who brings me flowers and looks just like dad. Apparently, when they showed me his license, I got really excited and told them he looked like that. Another thing I happen to actually remember is seeing something in church when I was a kid. During a service, I had seen a thick golden blanket kind of thing pass through the aisle. When I saw it, I remember turning to my dad and saying, Dad, I just saw God. And he laughed and said, no you didn't. Ironically enough, I grew up to abandon the Catholic faith. I wouldn't call myself agnostic, atheist or a skeptic, but I do always try to think of a logical explanation to things. I just feel like I'm going crazy. I'm so done being afraid and feeling this way and I have no idea where to turn to. I'm begging for someone here to help me understand what's going on. Recently, we bought a home that was built a few years ago and it's two stories. We're the second occupants. The original owners divorced and sold it to us. At least, that's what we were told. Nearly every day when I'm in the office, I can hear loud, and I mean loud, footsteps on the second floor. My son's room is directly above my office, and that's generally where we hear these footsteps. Though randomly, we hear footsteps upstairs in other sections, like when we're in the kitchen or living room. Every time, it freaks me and my wife out, and I run upstairs to see what's going on, but there's never anyone upstairs. I've even explored all of our attic spaces multiple times, just to see if we had a squatter. There's no evidence anyone is secretly living in the attic. I've checked more times than I care to admit. I thought it was our son when he was taking naps, like maybe running around. However, he's a young toddler, still in a bed he cannot get out of. I've tested him and it multiple times. He sleeps with a full sleep cover, so if he could get out of the bed, it's completely covered. And any time he's up there, I run up to catch him, but he's st always still asleep. We have old school baby monitors, and they too pick up the footsteps. Now, if this were not crazy enough, since we've moved in, multiple items have come up missing or moved. For example, we finished up a wine bottle one night, and when we woke up in the morning, it was gone. And when I say gone, I mean we checked every inch, inside, outside, and in all the trash containers. It was gone. Randomly, items will come up missing and show up in places we never put them. Some of this is likely attributable to our toddler, but most of the time, items disappear and reappear in places he physically couldn't reach. We're at a loss. 
Maybe we're haunted, or maybe we live at a nexus point. Either way, we're looking to sell soon, because living in the twilight zone is annoying. To start off, I work at a donut shop that is open literally 24 hours a day. Everyone wonders why we're open so late, but homies need their donuts, so it is what it is. I am lucky enough to work late night shifts, which I guess is prime time for paranormal activity. When I first got hired, I was pretty indifferent to the ideas of ghosts, spirits, demons, etc. I'm a college student, so I have a lot more important things on my mind, like not drowning my ass in debt or just having a good time. Right after I got hired, one of my friends who convinced me to get the job asked me what position I got hired for. When he found out it was for the late night shifts, my guy busts up laughing and says, good luck bro, hope you know how to catch flying donut boxes. He's usually a bit of a clown, so I really didn't think anything of it. The first experience I had came on my very first night. I was being trained on how to ring up orders correctly and navigate the menu system. It was around 2am at this point and it really wasn't too busy, so my trainer felt like he could leave me on my own for a bit and to call him over if I ran into any trouble. I pulled out my phone and started to run my playlist when all of a sudden I felt a cold finger tap me just under my shoulder. This made me freak the hell out immediately for one reason. My back was to the glass used to separate the customers from the register, COVID, which means nobody else could be standing there. I immediately turned around only to see nobody there and I called over my trainer to explain what just happened. He just nodded and smiled before saying, yep, welcome to the job kid. Surprisingly, it took this long for something to happen, honestly. The rest of my night was a tale of donut boxes constantly being thrown from shelves, lights turning on and off, my phone battery draining from 70 to 5% in about five minutes, you name it. One of my most frightening experience to date involved me actually seeing something. One of my duties at my job is to check the bathrooms to make sure they're clean and everything is in working order. On one of the nights I had to do this, my manager was with me. We began wiping down the sink when all of a sudden the door swung open. We both turned to look at the doorway and a huge guy walked in. He was probably close to 6'5 or 6'6 with a beard that would give Gandalf a run for his money. When he walked in a bit closer, the room just filled with the stench of rotten sour ass. It smelled like someone went to Chipotle, ordered everything on the menu and decided to unleash the depths of hell on our walls. This guy looks at me and asks if the bathroom is open to use. Me, assuming the man needed to unleash the contents of his pants, grabbed my things and walked out with my manager to let him do his thing. We both waited right outside the bathroom door for about five minutes before my manager suggested we go check on him. When we walked back in, it was completely silent and the stall door was closed. My manager and I both looked at each other in confusion and decided to knock on the stall door. No answer. I pushed it a little bit and it was unlocked. Nobody was there. This dude was nowhere to be found and there's only one exit out of that bathroom. I can say for absolutely certain, he didn't walk out of that bathroom. Obviously, there have been so many more experiences that have occurred, not only to me, but to everyone who works there as well. I will say though, it's a lot more fun to be the veteran of this place watching the new highs get freaked out at the voices, flying donut boxes, physical touches, etc. Because now I've been through it all and seen it all. This happened in Mexico. Me and my family are from a small town, on the outskirts of one of the biggest cities in the country. And it's become semi-urbanised since last century. So people here still have a strong folklore about supernatural things, in comparison with the rest of the city. So the paranormal stuff is seen here as something more accepted between the people. To the story. It happened at the beginning of last year, when the second wave of Covid really hit the country, causing almost all of the hospitals to get overwhelmed. One of my uncles works as a nurse in a hospital, so unfortunately, he caught the virus and ended up infecting his family and parents, as well as my grandparents, even before presenting symptoms. His father and my grandfather were brothers, and all of the tree houses are next to each other. 
The problem started when my grandpa and his brother started to get worse after they presented symptoms. So my parents decided to take my grandparents to our home in order to take care of them. Fortunately, my grandma didn't even present symptoms. But despite our best efforts, my grandpa was not getting better. Taking him to a hospital would have been a death sentence due to being overwhelmed as I mentioned before. Due to him being already dependent on oxygen tanks because of the virus. So transporting him was really difficult and a risk for his health. And even if he would have been accepted, the personnel inside of hospitals was not enough. We have more family members working inside hospitals, so we knew what was really going on inside of them, as he needed to be taken care of 24-7. After two weeks and all of our efforts, he didn't make it. So as you can imagine, it took a really big toll on us all. As for the brother of my grandpa, he ended up dying as well, both of them being in their 80s. Now, one of the usual things believed here is that when someone dies, the person stays around for a few days. I've never been someone who believes every story about paranormal stuff. I try to judge things from a more rational side, despite experiencing some things that still make me wonder about what we can really assure about what we know about paranormal things in general. This was my first experience with the belief I mentioned. The brother of my grandpa died a few days before him. The weird thing started the very same day his brother died. It started when I was in another room of my house as I was almost ready to get something to eat. So I was not in the same room as my grandpa. When all of a sudden, I saw a shadow for a brief moment exiting the kitchen. But I really thought it was my imagination due to the fatigue. My parents and I took turns to take care of grandpa, so he was never unattended, even at night, being lied to him when this happened, and ignored it. But after I heard the voice of grandpa's brother coming from the same room grandpa was in, and I have no doubt about that one, it was clearly him. Obviously I freaked out because it was impossible it was him because we were not in the same city he lives in and he was also in a delicate condition. So I went to check on grandpa but there was no one there and my other family members were not there at the moment. I gave it not that much of importance until a few hours later when we were informed that grandpa's brother had just died a few hours before. Even worse, after that, my grandpa started asking the condition of his brother any time he could. He had not until that day, despite not knowing he had died, being impossible, because we knew that if we told him, he would probably just get even worse in his health. So everyone just kept it secret, even my grandma. Even to his last days, my grandpa asked about him, and we just told him that he was better. We don't know if he believed it, because he said that his brother came every now and then to visit him. And as you can imagine, that being impossible... The day came when my grandpa did not resist anymore and passed away. Just a few after his brother. One of the most common things that happens here is that it's said that after someone has died, some other person who doesn't know that the person dies sees them. Like if they were making their daily lives for one last time. I did not believe in that before all of this happened, but the news of my grandpa's death took a while to spread as we were not in the same city they lived in. And as I said at the beginning, being from a non-completely urbanised place, people still knew almost everyone in the town, especially old people. When we went back to my grandparents' house to stay with my grandma, fortunately, my parents' work could still be done at home, we found some friends of the family who were really surprised about grandpa passing, as they said they had seen him just a few days before, still after his passing, and even had a brief chat with him. And knowing them, I do not distrust them as they are not the ones who attribute everything to paranormal stuff. And also their reaction was complete shock. Maybe I believed more easily due to what I experienced with grandpa's brother. Even for a few days after we arrived there, my grandpa's rocking chair swayed at random times. I would have known if the wind or a minor earthquake were the causes, because I know that house as the palm of my hand, because I lived there for a few years when I was younger. Sometimes plates would appear out of the kitchen without any logic, but we never really felt uncomfortable. I guess that's what it means when people talk about feeling their loved ones still being with them. This started to fade away slowly, and in the end, everything returned to being as normal as it could. When I was younger, about eight or nine, 
I spent the whole day at the local fair. I was showing my 4-H animals, and because the shirt was itchy, I had gone to my parents' car to change it. For some reason, there was just this old man next to the car though, I hadn't put much thought into it. This guy didn't give much explanation, but he asked me to get into his truck. I hadn't really been educated in kidnapping and stuff like that. I knew it wasn't a good idea to trust strangers, so I quickly said no thank you, and finished changing before running off. Skip forward several hours, and once I was done hanging out with some friends, I went back to the car for it to be gone. For context, I've never had a good relationship with my parents, and I really shouldn't be living with them, with all they do to me. Of course I was worried, and really didn't have any way to get back home, but walk. But that old man was still there. He said that he knew my parents, even said their names, and said he was going to take me home since they had forgotten me. Being a small town in Ohio, it didn't take much for everyone to know each other, especially when your grandfather was the favourite high school teacher for forever basically, so I really didn't question him and then climbed in. It was at this time that I noticed the first weird things, beside him still being in the same spot as earlier, as if he knew it was going to happen. His face would almost change if that makes sense, never appearing quite the same as it had only a few minutes before yet still recognisably being him all the same. Of course, he didn't take me home, but instead to his own home. Besides the normal kidnapping crap, there were many things off about this. We were seemingly phasing in and out of traffic, as if we weren't entirely there. Another thing of note is that when we finally did get to our destination, at first we had just turned into a cornfield before a small path just barely large enough for the truck made itself known. It was as if we were entering something otherworldly and that I was witnessing something that I really shouldn't have. At the point of him shutting the truck off, I had understood that I had been kidnapped, but something about him just made me feel so calm. Like I knew that nothing could go wrong in his presence, like no harm could be done to me. My time there was, for lack of a more fitting word, perfect. I had no worry of getting hurt from my parents, no stress to be as perfect as possible. No worry that every little thing I did wrong or forgot to do would get me hurt. I got to do whatever I wanted. Play games with him or bake or help him around the house or anything else my brain could come up with. Eventually the time came when I realised that I really needed to go back. No matter how perfect it was, I couldn't stay here any longer, simply just because I needed to get back home. Thus, I left as soon as I knew he had fallen asleep and just as we came into the corn, parted just large enough for me to pass through, while some fireflies fluttered about as if to light my path. It took me what felt like days to get back home, though it was probably only a few hours since nights hadn't broken. The whole time, it felt as if I was pulled in two separate directions. One down what I assumed to be the proper path home, and a lighter pulled back to that farmhouse. I kept trudging forward, and the moment I reached home, the moment dawn broke, the tether to the farmhouse was gone. After managing to somehow get inside, I learned something horrifying. I'd been there for 10 days, and just as suddenly as I disappeared, I had reappeared. Years later, around 11 this time, while out with friends, I noticed I was near that magical cornfield and just kind of went over to it, expecting something to happen, but nothing did. The corn simply swayed in the wind and even going deep enough into it that I should have found the house, there was nothing. No clearing, no beat up old pickup, no kind old man. I want to say this was just the delusions of a scared child and that trauma has made me misremember some, or most of the details, but that doesn't feel right. Still to this day, I see him sometimes, but it's always out of the corner of my eye or passing by in the streets only for me to turn around and either the person have a completely different appearance or that person just wasn't there altogether. For years, my best friend and I have collected an array of stories, from minor encounters with the paranormal to the almost horrifying. To make this story a small step into the weird, will be easier to understand my best friend and I. It was a late Saturday. We were both passed out in her full-size bed. She liked to sleep against the wall, while I like being free to move by the edge. 
I remember my dream so vividly. Like if I could fall asleep while typing this, I could be right back where we were. There were stacked rows of desks, like the classic college class auditorium. At the front there was a solid, light wood desk. It looked yellow in the scene, contrasted against the green Berber carpet. There was a smart board with a presentation on. I don't remember the exact words of the slide that well, but I do remember after I read my slide, it was my boyfriend's turn. I clicked the next slide and turned to her, indicating her turn to present the slide. As she began reading, I awoke halfway through her sentence. But when I woke, she was laying beside me, still reading the next slide. I freaked out. How was she reading the slide? I'm awake and she's still asleep. How? I started slapping her arm, trying to wake her up. She groggily slapped me away and said, I'm not done reading the slide yet. I was freaked out even more. I ran to the bedroom light and flicked it on. I bounded onto the bed and declared that she and I were going into the kitchen to drink coffee and talk about this. She was confused at first, but while the memory was fresh, I had to ask her what she remembered. She told me the layout of the room, the desk, the carpet, the smart board. She even pointed out that I had read the slide before hers. We both kept tossing back and forth about how there was no way. I think at the time, we remembered the topic of the presentation and she said she had no idea why she would know that stuff. We'll still reminisce on that scary dream hopping, and every time we do, I always wonder if we really had transported ourselves into each other's dream, or somewhere else. This happened years ago, but I still remember that night. My bed was in the space next to my door. The hallway light was on at this point as I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the dark, as I was still fairly young. So the room wasn't as dark to the point it was pitch black, but it was only as bright as the hallway light would go. I was sleeping on my side, back facing my room and front facing the wall. I remember being in a deep sleep. Honestly, a peaceful one at that. I heard whispering. I remember I couldn't understand what was being said. Like, they were all talking in tongues or a whole different language. When I was younger, I wasn't bilingual at all, so I really couldn't have known if it was a different language. It was like it woke me up immediately. I remember my eyes being forced open by shock. Not the kind of shock where someone throws you a surprise birthday party or something you weren't expecting. It was that shock that makes your stomach hurt. I knew someone was on top of me because I could see their outline. I didn't dare to move. I was just so scared. At one point, they stopped speaking and slowly started to move to the side of my room. My eyes were stuck to where that thing used to be and I remember having to talk myself up trying to gain just one bit of courage to look. I eventually did look, but as you could guess, nothing was there. I don't remember much about what happened afterwards. I just know that I eventually fell asleep. I haven't experienced something so terrifying since then. Every time I talk about it, being reminded of that dreadful feeling. When I was a child, I always got a weird feeling from my grandmother's house. Specifically at night. It was just always so hard to sleep for some reason. One night, I had a nightmare. It scared me so much I had to get out of bed to walk to my grandmother's room. My grandmother's room, however, was on the complete other side of the house. I walked down the hall, past the atrium, and I saw my shadow on the wall. This didn't frighten me right away, because I figured it could be the moon shining light on me through the glass of the atrium reflecting a shadow. But I noticed my shadow was extremely tall. I knew shadows could look distorted, but this didn't look like my shadow. I turned around to find a seven foot plus tall shadow figure standing clear as day in front of me. Being a child, I reacted the only way I knew how to. I kicked it in the private area and ran away. I went to my grandmother's room and told her what happened and she just waved it off. Now, I would just say this could be night terrors, etc. But growing up, 
I told my siblings about it, and my sister had seen the same thing. Years had passed, and we started to get too old to spend weekends at my grandmother's house. My brother lived there for a short while, and one of his previous girlfriends had seen it too. To this day, I wouldn't spend the night at her house. It's unsettling. I've even woken up to my grandmother staring at me while sleeping once when I was there. This hasn't been the only time I've seen shadow people though. I've seen them in the reflection of my TV, in the backseat of my car, out of the corner of my eye. I choose to ignore them. To me, it's not so consistent for me to think of its hallucinations. I've seen many shadow people, felt presences, and just recently seen a full body apparition. One thing I felt something watching me sleep so strongly. I was paralyzed in fear because I knew it was there. I've had sleep paralysis before and this wasn't it. At one point, I swore I felt my shirt riding up while sleeping. I tried to ignore it, but when I felt something touch my back, I told myself, oh hell no, and got up. I find it strange that I see things a lot while others don't. I do believe in ghosts and the paranormal, but it honestly scares me. I don't invite that energy. I don't want to communicate with them. I just want to be left alone. However, I can't help be curious. I've heard shadow people are mostly negative and that just frightens me because I've seen so many of them. If anyone has more info on them, I'd appreciate it. Anyways, this happened to me when I was about 9 or 10. I was preparing to go to sleep on a weekday and I got under the blankets when I heard someone walking to my room. When I was a kid, I always left my bedroom door wide open, but because of the layout of my bedroom, I can't see anything outside when I'm laying on my bed. I only realised it was my dad when he stepped into my room and stood by the door frame. That's when I noticed something really weird about him. He had this expression on his face like he wanted to kill me, or like if I had done something terribly wrong and he was furious at me. His eyes were completely open. At first, I thought I'd done something wrong like I'd clogged the toilet, or he tripped on one of my toys and came to my room to scold me. But he just stood there with the most serious look on his face for about 10 seconds, without saying a single word. My dad is the least serious person I know, and he's really talkative, so this unsettled me deeply. Then I asked him what's going on, and he didn't react at all. Now that I think about it, I don't think he even blinked during this whole thing. He stood there for about 4 seconds after I asked him, and then he just straight up disappeared. Like he edited out a video, or like he'd logged off from an online video game. I was dumbfounded. I sat on my bed completely frozen, thinking of an explanation to what just had happened. Was I dreaming? I recall being wide awake with my bedroom lights on, not being tired at all. In fact, at the time, I couldn't fall asleep if I didn't have my blankets covering my head, and I was also playing with my PSP before I heard the footsteps. So was he really in my room, and I had just suddenly fallen asleep? Then I woke up and he wasn't there? If so, then why did he have that terrible expression on his face? I checked the time on my PSP, and only a minute had passed since I turned its screen off. I concluded that I could have had a quick memory lapse, and he actually did leave the room normally. So I quickly ran to my parents' room to see if he was either in the hall walking to his bedroom, or inside it preparing to sleep. I woke him up, and his eyes were bloodshot red as they usually were when he had been sleeping for a long time. His hair was also really messy, unlike when he came to my room. I asked him in a serious tone if he had gone to my room before going to sleep. He saw that I wasn't playing around, sat on his bed and answered that the only time he had gone to my room had been at noon. I literally cannot explain what happened to me. My dad thinks it's pretty weird and I stopped mentioning it because he's pretty scared of the paranormal and I don't want to stress him out. I don't tell the story often since it's so ridiculous. I know nobody would believe me, but it's been bugging me for so long, I just want some sort of explanation. You can't make this shit up. So a while back, roughly around mid-November 2021, I was working night shift at my local 7-Eleven. 
My coworker was in the back cooking chicken, and I was out front taking care of customers and making sure our write-offs were done. When I heard the alarm telling me the door opened and a customer had entered the store, I spun around to greet them and as I did, I saw a black blur rush through the door and dart down the nearest aisle. At first I thought that it was a customer that really needed the washroom or something, but noticed I didn't see them pass by any other aisles leading to the washroom. So I decided to take a quick look around the store to make sure they weren't trying to steal anything. However, I couldn't find anyone in the store. They just disappeared. Roughly five to 10 minutes later, a woman entered the store and walked down all the aisles, seemingly looking for someone before calling out their name, Wesley. She only said it once before leaving the store. After that strange night, up until three days ago, things were normal. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary, but the only incident I found slightly strange was hearing banging through one of the walls in the kitchen one day. However, one of the bathrooms was on the other side of that wall and I was cooking at the time, so I really didn't know if we had any customers in there at the moment, which is completely possible, and could have been countless things they may have been doing. We've had extremely high people banging around in the bathroom before. Teens will sometimes decide to have sex in there. Needless to say, that washroom definitely seen some shit, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was a customer. Anyways, on Thursday, January 20th, I was once again working the night shift. And while doing my end of shift paperwork and printing off everything I needed, I was standing in front of the window facing all of the gas pumps. When for some reason, pump one popped up on the gas till, saying that someone clicked the request help button. But when I looked out the window, there was no one anywhere near the pumps. The entire lot was empty, except for a couple of cars belonging to other people in the area who also work night shifts in the neighboring stores. Later that same night when I went to the washroom, the door handle jiggle when I was inside. This was an employee washroom in the back, customers do not have access to. When I came back out, I asked my coworker if she was trying to open the door, but she was getting cookies boxed to sell to customers and never left the front of the store. This one happened to me when I was young, like elementary school age, pretty sure 4th or 5th grade. There's absolutely nothing to do in this little town, at least there wasn't when I lived there. So more often than not, this leads to kids being mischievous. This night was no exception. I waited until my grandparents fell asleep and then I snuck out, yes, at 4th or 5th grade, and met my friend up the street. We really had no plans. Like, what the fuck was a couple kids going to be doing out at night anyway? Wasn't the safest idea looking back. Anyway, I went up with my friend on his bike, and we just rode around together and teased each other and did typical 4th, 5th grader stuff. Now at the time, my friend only lived a few blocks away from me, maybe 2 or 3 blocks total. Wasn't that far, and I probably would have been too sketched out to go any farther at that age, honestly. So we're just riding up and down the street between his house and mine and we both suddenly got a horrible feeling. I say both because he had to have felt what I felt at the same time as we simultaneously stopped riding our bikes and just stared at each other for a second. I still can't really wrap my head around what happened next but I have a few guesses. As we stood there with this horrible feeling in the air it was almost as if the air suddenly had an electrical current through it. It's the best way I can explain it. All the hair on my body stood up and there was this sort of tingling feeling I guess you could say, followed by a deep, deep primal sense of fear. As soon as this primal fear hit, me and my friend for some reason looked into the sky. Now again, small town, not a lot of industrial lights. You can see the stars pretty clearly, especially on a night like this. What we saw, and the best way I can explain it, is this blacked out rectangle shape, extending for maybe a block and a half over us. It was a silhouette in the sky, and you couldn't see the stars through this thing. There was a perfect outline around it, and it definitely was a solid object. At this point, we realised it was hovering over us, I'd say maybe a couple hundred feet in the air overhead, and was projecting a shadow over us. Now I've experienced some scary stuff in my life, 
but I still don't ever remember feeling this primal of a fear. Sheer terror. My friend and I looked at each other and screamed, and I booked it out of there, riding my bike as fast as my little legs could go. The weird thing is though, I was only a block or two from my grandparents' house. It felt like it took an eternity to finally get back there, despite me pedaling as fast as I could. Now as an adult, 20 years later, I guess you could chalk it up to some sort of experimental craft that maybe we weren't supposed to see. I don't know. I can still feel primal fear, even thinking about this situation, and I still can't figure out what exactly happened that night. I went to middle school in a smaller town slash community. There honestly was absolutely nothing to do, besides go to the mini mall or to the community rec centre where they would hold these teen dances and play horrible early 2000s music. I ended up going to one of these teen dances per usual with a group of friends. And per usual, said group of friends got into it with the preps or jock kids. Fight breaks out, police are called, everyone scatters. Me and this kid who I'll just call Nate end up walking back to his house on this bike path that runs along the backside of this rec centre. It's night time and there's a skate park to one side of us for a while and then nature trails and a river on the other side. We keep walking along this path and suddenly Nate stops and says, do you see that? Pointing into the pitch blackness as he faced the direction of the nature trails and river. Now this kid was admittedly at times not always too nice to me and I thought he was just messing with me at first. I said, see what? There's nothing there. But at this point, this fool is walking towards whatever he thinks he sees. I see him walk right up like he's approaching a person. Looks back at me and he just crumbles. It was like he fainted or something. So now I'm in the middle of this path completely alone. And there may or may not be some type of presence that just caused my friend to pass out. I'm scared to death at this point, obviously. And this is all becoming too much for my 13 year old brain to handle. I'm half Hispanic and grew up around very religious elders and was always told when I had nightmares or if I ever felt evil that I needed to pray. I started walking towards my friend because I didn't want to leave him there, but I also didn't want to be alone. And I began praying. Now, as an adult, I am not religious, but at this time, I was doing whatever I thought would help. I went to try and pick my friend up and he was so heavy, abnormally. I was big for my age and he was much smaller than me, height and weight wise, and it was like I was trying to pull a grown man. I know dead weight, but this felt different. He also was ice cold to the touch, despite it being the middle of summer. I started to drag him and was praying and focusing on this one particular star as I did so. Not really sure why, looking back. But I focused on the star and prayed and prayed repeatedly. And my initial thought was to drag him to the hospital. But I swear the more I prayed, the brighter this star got. And it was like he was revived or something. He woke up annoyed that I was dragging him and scuffing his Iversons and confused about what had happened. He said that he saw an old man near the tree line when we were walking and that he motioned for Nate to come towards him. He said once he got close to the old man, this thing put his freaking hand inside of Nate, which was what apparently made him pass out. I was happy he was okay and that I wasn't alone, and we ended up walking back to his house like nothing happened. But I believe something did happen to Nate that night. Flash forward a month or so later, and per usual, I'm meeting up with my friends to once again to go to one of these teen dances. Because per usual, that's the only thing going on. I get to Nate's house, and the whole feeling is just off. Hard to describe really. I go downstairs to Nate's room and he's not in there, but sometimes happens and we were good enough friends that I would just wait for him to pop in, which he would normally do. But this time there was nothing. I go back upstairs and every single animal this dude had, which was like a cat and two or three small dogs if I remember right, were all standing hair raised with their backs to his front door, staring up. And I see my friend Nate sitting over this banister he had in his house in a weird way, feet dangling. Didn't see him there when I came in and he's just silent, scribbling and mumbling something. What's up man? I asked him nervously, not really knowing what the hell was going on at this point. Nate looked up at me and looked like he hadn't slept in a few days, 
deep circles under his eyes, and he says, I'm fucking scared. Confused, I ask, scared of what, bro? And he jumps down from the banister with a paper in his hand and gives it to me. The paper has the word death, and then just black scribbles, like he'd been sitting scribbling the same circle, in the same place for a long time. Instantly got all the bad vibes and nope energy, and I flat out told him, I'm going home, man, and opened the door, leaving his terrified animals in a corner, and wondering if they'd be okay. Long story longer, Nate eventually got into a lot of trouble, dealt some pretty crippling vices, and though he's still alive now, looks like a shell of his former self, or just not what you'd have expected this kid to grow up, to say the least. I think I witnessed a possession happen to him. I haven't told many people this story, and I don't think I've ever shared this in detail. I have other equally crazy stories from my time living in this strange small town, if anyone else is interested. I'm a 22 year old student male. I live in Fez, Morocco, where the university that I study is located. A few days ago, I was at a public cafe studying for exams, and as I was leaving for home, I ran into my friend, Mehdi. After the usual, hello, how are you, he told me something weird had happened to him. As he was walking to the cafe to meet me, he passed by an abandoned villa situated on a small street behind the cafe. The villa is old and is surrounded by a one and a half metre long wall that is further supported by a two metre long steel fence on top of it. The villa itself can only be viewed partly because of the vegetation behind the fence, old trees, untrimmed plants, the usual horror story stuff. As he was walking past the villa, my friend was caught by a weird creepy guy from behind the fence. When he approached the guy, he gave him a piece of candy rolled inside of a piece of paper as well as another piece of paper folded neatly and covered entirely by scotch tape. My friend thought it was weird, but didn't think much of it. As he continued to walk, he unwrapped the piece of candy, just to check if it is an actual candy, and threw it away. And then he moved to the scotched up piece of paper. After struggling with the tape for a bit, he managed to open and unfold it, to be surprised by a weird assortment of letters, symbols, and hard to decipher words in Arabic. In my culture, these things are taken very seriously, and the majority of Moroccans believe this stuff is real and works. So, my friend who studies Islamic jurisprudence was very surprised to know what it was. A hijab, not to be confused with the hijab, is a sort of magic charm that veils its users from harm and protects them from evil spirits. And in some occasions, it could also work as a bringer of love, appreciation, and service from other people. When my friend told me the story, I was instantly intrigued. For all my life I've been curious about these things, although I do not believe in them and still don't to this day. I wanted to see if the spell would work. I took the piece of paper from him, gave it a quick scan to see what it was about, and gave it back to my friend, telling him to keep it until we go back home and see what it's about. When we did get back home, we opened it again and read it another time, more closely together. The wording of it is quite weird and hard to decipher, not to mention it has some weird symbols, one in the shape of a cross, and the other is in the shape of an athala rune, and the other two are of a shape that I couldn't decipher, but they look like the unequal sign, only with three horizontal lines in the middle. Upon closer inspection, the words we could manage to decipher translate to something like this. O oh God, I have sacrificed this unborn child for you to bring your servants. O oh most great one, to bring unto him acceptance, love and victory. The servants referred to here are the jinn, to whom whoever made this spell wished to appoint the job of bringing the man who gave it to my friend good luck and fortune. When Mehdi read that, he interpreted the supposed sacrifice of the unborn child as bringing the crazy man the love that children get from others. Mehdi was scared, but I was unbothered, seeing it as nothing but pointless words that have no meaning, but since my friend was really scared because the spell was given to him, he consulted with his roommate, a psychology student, who advised him to burn the spell to break it if it had any real effect, and to relive 
himself from any unwelcome thoughts that it would invite into his mind if it was kept on him. Medi and I went out to the roof to the house and burned the spell together. Skip forward a couple days. Medi and I were walking together back from the usual cafe we sit in, and for some reason he told me to go down a path we never took before. That's completely the opposite side away from where I live. I said yes, and we went for a walk until we arrived at the same villa he got the piece of paper from, and we saw the same guy that gave him the spell standing behind the fence with his face between the bars of steel and staring aimlessly at nothing. At this point, Medi and I no longer cared about the supposed hex or curse he cast on us, so we jokingly agreed to approach the guy and speak to him. The moment he saw us, he called us as we were approaching him, and we started talking to him. He introduced himself as Hamid. The villa he's in is supposedly his uncle's, and so is another cafe in front of it. We didn't believe him, as he's obviously not all sane in the head. He can speak and understand well enough, but something about his empty, emotionless gaze and super relaxed posture, as if he doesn't have a single care in the world, as well as the way he speaks completely spontaneously, without even thinking, screams insanity. We asked him about the piece of paper he gave us. He said a police officer gave it to him, an obvious lie. We told him we took the piece of paper to a faki, the Moroccan Islamic version of a priest, and he simply answered something akin to, yeah, sure you did. He saw right through our lie. As we were talking, he started giving us commands as if we were his servants, but doing so in a completely straightforward, non-condescending way, as if it's just natural for him to ask people for things and get them for free. He asked us to get him a simple soft drink from a nearby grocery store, to which we declined, but he insisted. So we told him to wait until tomorrow and we'll get it for him. Fast forward to tomorrow, we go past the villa again and he's there his head between the steel bars of the fence, staring aimlessly at nothing, his big round eyes and toothless mouth gaping open. We saw him, said our hellos, and immediately he started giving commands. Go get my drink, now. His commands became more assertive, but still non-condescending and straightforward. The way he speaks is like that of a child. So we told him to ask us nicely and we'll get it for him. He did, and we went to get him the drink. When he got it, he simply threw it to the ground and asked us for a bar of soap. We asked him what he wanted to do with the soap. He said he'll be going to a traditional bathhouse and he needs soap to clean himself. So we got him the soap. And he threw it on the ground next to him too. He asked for something else and we said that's enough. We'll be going back home. And we did. I'm writing this at the usual cafe I sit at, waiting for my friend Mehdi to come over so we can visit the guy again. My friend and I joke about the hex having actually worked on us, and that's why we bought him that stuff yesterday, and are going to visit him again tonight too. But something deep inside of me questions me about it actually being true. What if we did get hexed, and now we're servants to this crazy homeless guy living in this abandoned villa? I actually bought some pizza earlier that I only ate one slice of, and I'm now keeping it for the crazy guy when we go meet him. In fact, it's very likely that the spell did not work, and we're just doing this because we think it's fun, and like talking to the guy, but I can't help thinking that the spell did work. Anyway, I'd love to read your opinions on the matter. Should I go see the guy again, or should I just forget about it and never go near the area again for my safety? My old house felt weird. I'd always thought I'd seen shadows in the corners, but I just shook it off as I got older. There were two times I remember something sounding like it had fallen. A big bang or boom sound, followed by a clattering sound, only to never find anything that had fallen. It happened once when my mom and I were in the kitchen, and we went to the basement to explore what it was, but found nothing. We moved in 2000, the new house didn't have any weird feelings or events other than the first night. I could have sworn I saw someone move by the bedroom door. I thought it was my dad walking by, but when I got up to ask him, he was downstairs watching TV and said he never walked by my door. I always thought it was my dad's father checking up on him. 
didn't have any real experiences outside of that. A few times in the woods smoking a joint, I got the noia hitting hard and felt like either a bear was coming or we were being watched. Got in the car shortly after. Then my mom passed away in the 2010s. At the time, I wasn't religious, but a couple weird things happened. The last word she told me was that I was a good person, which was weird because at the time, I was always thinking about how I needed to work towards being a better person. Then, she was supposed to be pretty much brain dead from a stroke, but the first day in the hospice when I arrived, she had a huge smile on her face and looked right at me as I entered. I didn't know what to think at the time, but now I feel like it was her way of saying goodbye. She never did it again that I saw, and passed a few days later. I distinctly remember having a dream with her in it a while after. We were at our old church, and she was in the foyer chatting with someone. I noticed her sitting, talking to her friend, and I think I said, Mom? But all I remember is she looked right at me, smiling, and I felt a bunch of positive emotions. Just pure love. Later, I remember I was chatting with a woman, and she just happened to mention something about finding dimes left behind by your loved ones. What was so weird about that is since my mom had passed, I had noticed specifically dimes popping up in weird places. And when this lady told me that, it felt like it all clicked. It even happens now, and I always think of my mom and dad. After my mom passed, I was more open to everything, since my mom was really spiritual. Some things she had told me before, just general stuff, and they started to come true. So I knew I had underestimated her teachings. A few years after that, my dad sadly passed as well. Both were tough to let go, but I was more understanding this time than with my mom. Back then, I was very angry, but now I realised this was just how things had to go. My dad didn't pop up for a while in my dreams and I was worried. Then one day, I had an extremely vivid dream. I guess I should have mentioned that I usually don't remember my dreams, so sticking with me means more, I suppose. Basically, in the dream... I'm in bed and someone is coming to smother me with a pillow. But I see it coming, so I'm ready to explode when they do. As I do in the dream, I wake up. The lighting of the room is the exact same as in the dream. Fairly bright and sunny. I'm a little shaken up by the dream, because I couldn't see the figure in the dream, just the pillow. My room door was closed and I heard my dog whining outside, probably to go outside. I open the door and much to my dismay... My dog has shit everywhere on the main floor. It took me a while to put the dream and the dog pooping together, but then I realised someone woke me up and it had to be my dad. He was always funny about waking me up when I was a kid, and he was very close with my dog. I did see my dad in later dreams, a few times with my mum with his greyish hair, and then once looking much younger, which admittedly threw me off. I'd only seen a few pics of him from the 80s and even fewer from the 70s, but it was him for sure. I did notice my mum in my first dream, encountering her looking younger too. I was about nine when this happened. Me, my mum and my sister moved into this old house that was made before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about it when it was in its glory days. Well, everyone in our town said the place was haunted. That just set off signals in my head, especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually rubbed it off, but I still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched and never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable, and I just hated it and begged my mom not to move us in. Yeah, that didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something stupid like that, but it skipped a generation, or something like that. My room was the worst to be in, always freezing, always felt heavy, and always had something weird going on. My sister always hated going past my room to go to the restroom, and I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men, women and children from the corner of my eye. One time, I was even making a sandwich. I saw the shadow woman in the hall and I just said hi and made my sandwich. 
I turned for some reason and saw a shadow man maybe a foot from me. It took a moment before I ran to my room. One time when I was sleeping in the living room, I felt a hand press against my back and heard light footsteps. It felt like a male's hand. My parents had divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time, I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room and I made the joke that the ghost should move it. It took a moment before it shot across the table and just stopped on the edge. I jumped and ran. Another time, I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. I'm not like skin tone and hair colour. She was translucent. She was grey with gouged out eyes with blood going down her face. She had a dress on with a coat. I stayed frozen before I jumped up and moved past her. My sister rubbed it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was at a friend's house. He saw the same exact thing but rubbed off until he heard my story. But what made this so much weirder is that it's the same girl from the window before we moved in. I have so many more stories about this house and I hope it falls soon. It was a sad house and I don't know how else to describe it. I want to preface this by saying I'm not religious. Spiritual, but not religious. I believe in cleansing with sage, incense, crystals, all of that. Pretty common nowadays, I know. I like to think I'm pretty in touch with the unexplained, but this has been taken to another level. So I've had sleep paralysis since I was 15. It's just something I grew used to. Other than the initial shock and fear, it didn't really bother me. When I was 19, I was living with my aunt and I could just feel there was something in the house. But there was one experience that changed my perception entirely. I was working at Ulta at the time. Most of my job was showing customers products and swatches. I normally used to get sleep paralysis when lying on my back, but this specific night before I worked, I had fallen asleep on my stomach and ended up having a really bad episode. And she, my sleep paralysis demon who was always the same woman, was sitting on my back this time, pinning my wrists down. I could paint the picture of it all, of the details so well. This was by far the most intense. Skin crawling episode I ever had. My wrists were throbbing. I thought I could feel her digging her fingers into my skin. I could feel her legs squeezing my ribs and even her hair brushing my back. It was so vivid. I came to, of course there was no one actually in my room, but my skin was crawling. When I went into work the next day as usual, went through my normal day. I'd been washing my arms off from all the swatches and my coworker pointed out this weird brown shade that wasn't coming off. I brushed it off, but when I was showering later, I tried scrubbing it off and although it didn't hurt, it didn't budge. There were identical bruises on both wrists where she had been holding me the night before. This changed my perception of sleep paralysis entirely. It no longer felt just like bad dreams. It became very real. Moving out of that house, things seemed to halt. I hadn't had sleep paralysis or negative spiritual experiences for about three years, until last night. So I moved in with my boyfriend about two months ago. The house has never felt bad or negative to me. Me and my now four month old puppy have been doing pretty gay. Brutus, the puppy, has had a couple of weird incidents. Barking in an empty dark room, waiting in front of the doors with no one inside and randomly going nuts. I figured I'd sense anything awry, so I chalked it up to just being a crazy puppy. I saged the house regardless when I moved in. It's just part of my personal anointing process. I light incense pretty regularly and things have been really good. Until last night. I get home a little after 2.30 in the morning. I wasn't super tired and my boyfriend and I stayed up for a while talking. I decided I probably needed some sleep, so we went to bed. He fell asleep holding me in a very specific position. I fell asleep, but it was kind of like a weird half awake, half asleep kind of feeling. I was asleep with my eyes closed though. It was weird because it felt like I was awake. It was so vivid. In my dream, I was looking at my boyfriend in a different position than I saw last and right behind him was a woman. Not the same woman I used to see either. Her image shook me to the core. All of the stereotypical sleep paralysis demon features Dark hair, pale skin. The thing that freaked me out the most was its eyes. They were wide open, staring at me from behind my boyfriend's head. 
I couldn't see her mouth because only the top part of her head was peeking over him, but it looked like she was smiling. It took me a solid 15 seconds to force myself awake. I physically had to pry my eyes open, which is why I don't believe it was sleep paralysis, and I could move as soon as I actually woke up. When I looked and saw that my boyfriend was now in a completely different position, the one he was in in my dream, I instantly felt nauseous. This did not feel right at all. As soon as I woke up, I sat up hyperventilating and crying because of how bad this energy felt. My boyfriend just tried to comfort me by telling me it's just a dream and all that, but this was different. This felt demonic. I ended up shaking and crying in the bathroom last night, dry heaving from the image. Her face has burned so deeply in my mind I can't sleep. I'm cleansing the house again today, but something is telling me this is deeper than that. My boyfriend believes in the paranormal and doesn't have a problem with the way I handle things, but he is one of those, if I don't see it, it doesn't bother me kind of people. Ever since I can remember, I've had some scary experiences with things I can't really explain. From things falling off counters to seeing people that weren't there, it became a norm for me and my family to the point of us ignoring things. I believe it was all connected to the house we were living in at the time, because as soon as we moved out, these unexplainable things hit a plateau. But this experience was too stunning to ignore. First, a little bit to know before I start the story. It was a pretty chill night at my house. Everyone was asleep except me, my sister and my brother's baby. Avery, who was about 10 months at the time. Avery was very attached to my sister, so she often slept with us. Me and my sister shared a room with a bunk bed. And of course, being the youngest, I got the top bunk. This bunk bed was worn and creaky. If someone was moving or doing anything at all, it would make a noise. Anyways, on this night, I was watching TV while my sister went out to do something, leaving Avery sleeping on the bottom bunk. She had been in a deep sleep for about 30 minutes, and usually when she hits the 10 minute mark, we know she's out for the night. To my surprise, my sister came back to the room pretty quickly and sat down very aggressively on the bed, as well as leaving the door open. Her heavy sit caused a loud creak to come from the bed, so loud it made the baby wake up. I heard a quiet shh come from my sister from the bottom bunk. Avery started crying heavily. I've never heard her cry so hard, but I chose to ignore it because my sister was with her and would calm her down. But after 20 minutes of constant crying, I couldn't take it anymore. I wondered what my sister was doing instead of comforting the screaming baby right beside her. I was annoyed beyond belief. Are you serious? I bend my head over to look at the bottom bunk and all I see is Avery, sitting there, tears rushing down her face, alone. My heart completely dropped. It felt like I couldn't breathe for a second. My body went completely cold, although I was in a well-heated house. My sister then bursts into the room, screaming at me for not doing anything about the crying baby. I was absolutely stunned. I saw my sister come in. I heard her sit down, and the door was still wide open from when she first came in. She asked me why I wasn't doing anything, and I simply replied, I thought you were in here. To this day, she says that I was the palest she'd ever seen me. Neither of us can explain who or what I saw, or what I was trying to do to the baby. Over this summer of 2021, I was visited by an angel named Tibri. I know how this sounds, but I need to document this on the web in case anybody else ever comes across a similar situation. I was driving to meet up with my friend and go and have as much fun as you could in New York during peak COVID restriction times. I was depressed, driving and listening to all my favorite sad songs on my way to hang out with my friend. I park up around the corner of his house and just start crying thinking about my future with school and my business that I'm launching this year. I lit up a cigarette and a few seconds later I was begging God for an answer and crying about my future. Out of the corner of my left eye, a random guy who looks like a Greek god with golden blonde slash straight slash dread like hair, think Zeus, appears next to my car on the sidewalk, one way. He had a golden aura surrounding him as if he was going super cyan from Dragon Ball Z, but very light. 
I could not tell you for two billion dollars whether he was white or Mediterranean, or what, but he looked like an actual representation of what churches make gods look like in their art, even down to the halo part around the whole head. He walks up to me on some very casual New York shit, Queens. As I'm crying, he asks, Angel, I got bud if you need. Me, nah bro, <laughs> I'm good, I appreciate you. He starts walking away and comes back once more asking, you sure bro? Take my number down. I'm always around here. And for some reason I respond, You know what? Yeah, man, you seem cool. I've just been going through a lot. He goes, You shouldn't be sad. Everything's gonna be okay. You got this. I got goosebumps. I ask the angel for his name, and he's giving me his number, and he says, Tibri. I texted the number saying, Nice to meet you, bro. And he walks away and responds exactly three seconds later, You too, my brother. I'll see you soon. And walks to the corner of the block less than 15 yards. An immense light just shines down this one-way street and he disappears. I turn my car on, drive to the intersection, and there's only three places he could have gone. Straight, left, or right. He went neither. He vanished. In less than 10 seconds, this man was gone, and he walked to the corner. His phone number no longer works. Goes straight to, we're sorry, this number has. Some of you may laugh. But I feel like if an angel were to ever approach you and send you a message, what's the best way you think they could do that won't make it too obvious? For me, being raised in New York, you always got someone trying to sell you weed and take their number down, so I'm used to it. So instead of an angel coming down with its wings out and an obvious halo, what if they just pop out as a regular customer at your job? Or just someone you let cross the street, even when you have the green light? Or that homeless person who truly wants something to eat? What if that's why we are told to love each other equally? Because you never know who you could be really talking to. For all we know, this reality is all a test. And you need to pass the test by shedding kindness onto every soul you meet. If I caught my angel slipping, just know Tribby, I'm going to make fun of you for eternity. This happened about 11 years ago when I was a child. Don't really remember the exact age, but I remember it was during the summer holidays. I live in Central Europe, and my father comes from a village in a neighbouring country. The village has a population of about a thousand, so basically the whole village knows each other. And the village is a little bit, well, weird. It doesn't really have much to do with people. They're all really nice and like to see our family when we came there every summer holidays for two weeks. We didn't really go there for about four years because father and uncle had a big fight about grandmother's heritage after she died, but I plan on going there alone once this whole COVID thing is over. So I guess I'll start with the stories. First, the village and the house of my grandmother, where I also have my own experiences. So the first story is one that was around the village where my dad was little. Once there was a church celebration slash mass or what is it called, and it was about this one man. I don't really know much about churches, but this one has that tiny balcony where you can observe things from above, and it has some extra seats. He went there because it was the last place with empty seats. He sat on one in the corner, but had fallen asleep. He woke up some time later, and the church thing was still going, but something felt off. Apparently, after some time, he realised that the people there were already dead, and buried behind the church, and everything was silent. He was scared, so he tried to open the front door, which was unfortunately locked. By the way, the spirits were staring at him this whole time. After some time, he had an idea to go up and wake up the village using the church bell. It worked, and the village gathered and unlocked the door so he got out. The ghosts were not there anymore, and his hair went grey from all the fear. I heard other stories, but I don't remember all of them, so if people who read this want, I can ask my father about other stories. So now to my dad's experiences. It's nothing special, but I'm just surprised at how many of them there are. First, when he was a teen. There was a celebration, and he and his friend were messing around on the edge of the forest. At one point, they both saw the light deep in the forest. They tried to investigate. My father is really brave about these things. So they took a bucket of water in case of fire and went up. When they arrived, no light was to be seen. It was just pitch black like it tends to be in the forest. So they looked around for a bit and then went back. 
After some time, they again looked up the hill and saw the light again, but this time they were too scared to go there. So they kind of forgot about it, and the light disappeared after some time. Then, when he was older and was in high school, this one is probably the creepiest and always seemed too fake to me. So I later thought it was just some bedtime story my dad made up. I joked about it a few years back, however, and my dad started to shout at me and was really angry with me for some time afterwards. That made me believe he was telling the truth, because he seemed genuinely angry that I was making fun of it. So he was in high school in a nearby city, and would always arrive home pretty late. This one evening was in winter, and it was around 11pm. From the bus stop you have to take quite a long road to the house. Then it's just a few more houses, and then the forest. So he was walking towards his house. A few hundred meters away there's a turn, so you cannot see very well what's further down the road. But then there arrived an old lady, and she was coming right towards him. He already knew something was off, because what would an old grandma be doing outside at this time? She was pretty normally dressed. She had a skirt and a headscarf. But after they got closer, he noticed something. She was normally dressed, but instead of a face, there was nothing. Just a black hole. He was obviously really scared, but continued to walk towards her. They crossed each other, but she didn't seem to be aware of his presence. So she kept walking towards the village, and my dad ran home and went to sleep. Those are the two that I remember. There are, of course, a few more. And now to the house stories. So first, my dad when he was already an adult, and slept there for a few nights. His grandmother used to live with them when he was little. He had a room on the second floor, and his bed was facing the door. Every morning, his grandma would look through the glass that was on the door, to see if he was awake, and then she opened the door. So now he's an adult, and is sleeping in the same position as when he was little. It was close to midnight, and he was looking at the locked door. At one point he asked himself, what would you do if the doors opened right now? And just a few seconds later, the doors would creak and open. He was staring at them for a few minutes, waiting for something to happen. Then he got up, unlocked them again, and went to sleep. The second one is from my uncle when he was about 11 years old and home alone at night. The stairs to the second floor always creak incredibly loudly. He was about to go to sleep when the stairs started to creak, as if someone was walking on them. He was scared, but managed to put the blankets over his head and fall asleep. And now to me and my twin sister. We recently talked about this, and I told my sister I always felt weird and scared on the second floor. And when I had to go up there, I would go super quickly, and then sprint back down. I was surprised she told me that she felt the same. First her story. Me and my dad were sleeping in a tent in a garden. We were about nine years old. My grandma and mom were sleeping downstairs, and she was sleeping on the second floor. She told me that she heard the door open, and someone was walking around the room. Then she suddenly felt cold, like someone was hugging her. This lasted for about a minute. Then it stopped, and the door closed again. And finally my story. It's pretty similar to my uncle's. I was quite addicted to video games when I was about ten years old. So once, there was some kind of celebration, and everyone from the house went there except for me because I wanted to play. So it was around 5 p.m. and I was playing downstairs in the living room when suddenly I heard the stairs creak incredibly loud like someone was stomping on it. I waited for nothing and bailed from there to the garden where I spent the next two hours before everyone got back and I grew even more scared of the second floor in the stairs. My family went camping over the weekend, down in the Wyoming slash Yellowstone area. It was my immediate family and my cousins. One night during that stay, it began to rain, and my cousin and I decided we didn't really want to get soaked in a tent. So we moved into my mom's red suburban and put the seats down and just stayed up and talked. I'm not entirely sure what time it was given I didn't have a clock, but I'm assuming sometime around 2.30 or 3. We were talking for quite some time, to the point that even the forest was quiet. I sat up and looked out the back window of the vehicle and stared deep into some trees. Before anything bad happens, I always get a feeling beforehand. I remember staring down this line of trees and just getting an overwhelmingly bad feeling. Anyways, that feeling had caused me to just lay back down and continue talking to my cousin. I really didn't have the time or energy to see anything that night, 
because I knew if I kept staring in that direction, I would have seen whatever it was. As I was laying next to my cousin, a blue orb swiftly passed around the car we were in. It was about the size of a basketball, maybe bigger. It was incredibly fast, so fast it shook the car. I jumped due to it surprising me, and I quickly grabbed onto my cousin and asked him, Did you see that? He gets a little startled from my sudden grab of his arm, and he just says he didn't see anything. I brush it off, and assume it's just my lack of sleep messing with me. Anyways, fast forward about two minutes, a massive light blue glowing orb starts to surround the vehicle we're in. It's making a noise that I will never forget. It's sort of like when a car at high speed passes you. It gets loud, then quiet, then loud again. The whole car was shaking as these orbs continued circling this car at this insanely high speed. This time, he's experiencing it too, and I'm clenching his arms so hard and screaming while he's screaming with me. This happens for what about what feels like forever, but in reality, it was probably just a matter of seconds, maybe ten. After the orbs vanished, we kept holding on to each other for a couple minutes while shaking. Neither of us wanted to open our eyes. He says he saw something different than orbs. He described it as a tesseract triangles absorbing into each other, like a dolphin swimming through water. But he described them as light blue and glowing, just as I did. My family is pretty abnormal, I'd say. Either that or gifted. We see lots of things that people would probably call us schizophrenic or crazy for. Hence, why I don't share these things with people outside of my family or in a circle. And normally, when I do have other people with me, they can see these things too. My mother and stepdad had recently finished building their house when I was about 9 or 10 years old. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere and actually right next to a prison as well as a military facility. My brothers and I all got to pick our new rooms and I chose the room with the windows facing the front of the house. Since the house was brand new, we hadn't had the blinds installed yet. Really, the only furniture the house consisted of was our beds and a couch in the living room. Before I experience these abnormal or paranormal things, I always get chills down my spine. I can sense it before it happens, and it's as if the hairs on my neck perch up, and I can feel the direction energy it's coming from. I believe it was the first night of our stay there. I had my bed right next to the window. I was struggling to fall asleep, so I just stared outside at this single street lamp right next to our driveway. I instantly felt sick, nauseous, and just overall icky. Something was going to happen, and I was sensing it, and I just couldn't look away. I have a bad habit of just staring directly into the direction the energy is located. As I was staring, I saw this large humanistic creature thing. It was terribly skinny and freakishly tall. My heart just stopped. I've seen many freaky things before, but not like this. It's so tall, just slightly shorter than the street lamp, with long skinny arms that drag behind it as it slowly limps across. God, I was so frightened that I was frozen. I probably was holding my breath from the fear that just capsulated me. As I see it limp across my yard, it crosses that street lamp. It illuminates all of its features and it's just disgusting and horrifying. It has no hair, it's fleshy, it's tall and skinny. Its features and its face are sunken in yet it has no eyes, or lips, or any of that. Its legs are slightly bent as its arms drag behind. It's so vivid in my memory even now. I remember every detail and I'm 18 years old. Anyways, I just stare at it in complete fear as it crosses slowly. And after it passes the light, it just vanishes. I ran into my older brother's room after that and just slept on his floor. Let's just say, I basically stayed up the whole night making sure whatever that was didn't come in. The energy just located in the area in general was terrible. I never left that house at night alone unless something was watching me. Does anybody know what that creature could have been? I've got many other stories to share. My family is pretty cursed with seeing these sorts of things.
The roof was technically not the exclusive use of our kindergarten, as it was shared between our building and the next, and their penthouse also had access to said roof, but the family that owned the contiguous apartments had an agreement with Baba to let them use it. Said family also happened to have a daughter, who we were told was sick, but once she would make full recovery, she would join Baba and be able to study while play with us. This girl, by the way, is the protagonist of this story. After noticing her looking at us from inside her home, and having taken as much of a liking to her as a little kid of that age can, I asked her to come play with us, to which she replied she was not allowed to, as her parents told her that it could make her more sick. However, after a few days talking from her window, we found a way to cheat the system. She would leave the door of her house open and would throw a ball at me, which I would throw at her in turn while we talked, which her parents thought was cute, and so did our caretakers. So much so that they told my parents, who wasted no time to tease me and claimed that I had a girlfriend, which embarrassed and angered me, and would tease me almost daily, whenever they would fetch me and would find me playing with her. This detail would be important later. After a few months, however, the girl stopped showing up. I was told by one of our carers that her health had gotten worse, and that she could no longer play with me, and I never saw her again. While I was very upset about it initially, my parents and I moved away during that summer, and soon I was too busy making new friends in my new school to remember about her, as kids are wont to do. Ten years passed, until one day, after I told my mother that I had gotten my first girlfriend, she decided to tease me and claim she was the second, as the girl in the kindergarten came first. This tease made all the memories of that girl come rushing back, and after a few weeks of not being able to take it off my head, I decided to return to where Baba used to be, and with some luck, find the girl and see if she would remember to me. Luckily for me, the family still lived in the house, and after I introduced myself and told them a very abridged version of the story through the speaker, they invited me to come up and talk. The father explained to me that sadly, the girl had passed away all those years back, but not to worry, as rather than inconvenience them, it made them happy to meet someone else who remembered their daughter after all those years, although he did say he didn't remember her ever playing with me. He did, however, confirm that they didn't let her come out to play with the kids from Baba, as her health was very bad, and they feared it may got worse if she runned around. Her mother, however, seemed somewhat bothered. And she mostly just stared at me silently. And once her father began showing me pictures of the girl that they still conserved, which by the way, was indeed the girl I remembered, she suddenly asked me how old I was, to which I replied that I was indeed 16. And this is where the story turns weird. The second I mentioned my age, both her and the father were visibly shaken and disturbed. And the father quickly asked me to confirm my birth year, which is 1986. After looking at each other and then at me with bewilderment, the mother, which as I mentioned had been mostly quiet, began telling me, visibly upset, that it was impossible that I had met their daughter because their daughter had passed away in 1986. That made no sense because my mother remembered her just as much as I did and I do remember our carer mentioning that she was ill and could no longer play with us. So that's two adults and myself that remembered her. Yet her parents insisted that she passed away in 1986, and her father even borderline angrily threatened with showing me her death certificate. Things got very tense, and I felt extremely uncomfortable, and so did the family. So I excused myself, which they did make no effort to stop, and left, never to return for another 10 years. By the time I was nearly 26, I decided to return to the house once more despite feeling extremely uncomfortable about it, because as silly as it sounds, I could almost not believe my own experience, and I wanted to find out the truth. But by then, the apartment belonged to someone else. I'm now nearly 36, and I still cannot forget this story, which keeps coming back, usually after I have a dream about it at random, every couple of years. When I was around 14 or so, I had two friends very interested in magic, Wicca and the supernatural. I'll call them Abby and Brittany. One day, Brittany wanted to try something she had read about, 
a massage that was supposed to open up the senses or something and be a spiritual type release. This massage was supposed to only be done with two people in the room, but we were young teens and didn't care. We decided to try it in Abby's room, in what was basically an attic. Brittany would massage Abby first. We turned off all the lights so it was pitch black, and Brittany started on Abby's shoulders. I was sitting on the floor, unable to see anything, and that's when it happened. I began to feel weak and lightheaded, like I was about to pass out. I took a deep breath and was suddenly no longer in Abby's room. I had been transported somewhere else entirely. A bright blue sky, no clouds and no sun expanded above me. Flat beige rock was as far as I could see. From the rock, people were growing, almost entirely made of beige rock. Some were formed more than others, some were just tall blobs. It was like the blobs were being shaped by an unfelt wind. I walked along in the eerie quiet surrounded by these people until I came to a rock woman in the middle of my path. She was older, her hair in a bun with glasses on her face, and her arms had not been formed yet. I was just standing there looking at her when just as suddenly as I had arrived, I was back in Abby's room. Abby was crying and Brittany quickly turned on the lights. She told us that she'd seen a dark place with reds and blacks. It had scared her badly. I didn't tell them what I saw. I had thought that was that. We never spoke of it again. A couple of years later, Abby and I were at the mall. I had to use the restroom, so I went and did my business and walked out the store to the sinks. And that's when a woman approached me. She held out her hands. They were wet from washing and said in what I'm thinking was Italian, scusi. She was dressed in beige from her glasses to her high heels, with her greying hair in a bun. I was shocked, but showed her how to use the air dryer for her hands. She said grazie. We smiled at each other, and I walked out. I never saw her in real life again, but a few years after our encounter, I had a dream. The beige woman was laying in a canopy bed, surrounded by thick purple and red blankets and her family. A window could be seen looking over a beige city with a bright blue sky. It was clear she was on her deathbed. She told me something, and I wish I could remember what it was. And then she peacefully passed. That's when I woke up sobbing. For years when I would think about her, I would tear up, and would feel like I was having an adrenaline rush. When I finally was able to tell others about this, I couldn't speak about without crying. I often wonder about the beige place with the bright blue sky. Was it creation? The Matrix? The place where we're all connected? Why her? Had I not seen her before, wouldn't that be a completely insignificant encounter? And of course, what does all this mean? I was 14, so maybe my memory is foggy, but I swear to God it's real. Spirits and ghosts were always a joke to me, until this moment when I legitimately felt like something happened. So three or four years ago when I was around 13 or 14, I was with my close friend at the time. Me and him always hung out and I would stay the night and all that jazz, as one would do as a 13 year old. I trusted him. His house was kind of a big backyard where we would always play soccer. Now, if you're standing flush to his house looking at his backyard, there's a normal wood fence straight ahead, and a normal one to the right. To the left, there was only a two cinder block high little wall. He would always tell me that he saw big black figures, and shit in his neighbour's house windows and yard and porch. Meanwhile, might I add that nobody lived there at the time. I would always write it off as him just jokingly saying these things to mess with me. He would always describe them as these eight foot tall black masses. Just pitch black things standing there or existing there. And when he would look away, it would go away or move closer. Keep this in mind. So, me and him are in the backyard, messing around, playing soccer, kicking the ball, eating whatever you do at 13. We have our goal set up with shoes instead of the cinder block wall. Dumb as hell. I shoot a couple, they bounce off and come back. When I hit one and it goes over the wall, into the neighbouring house's yard and rolls to the furthest corner of the yard. Of course, my friend being him said, you kicked it, go get it. Willingly, I jump over the little wall and head to the ball. As I walk over, 
Yes, walk. I don't know what I was thinking. I feel the only way I can describe my stomach dropping like a roller coaster. I turn my head towards the neighbor's house and standing against the wall is this massive, at least eight and a half foot black mass. Just there, existing. I froze, ball in front of me and all I could do was stare. I felt like it was holding me mentally. I wasn't focused on anything but it, its entire body. I heard my friend tell me to hurry up and I finally snapped. I grabbed the ball and I looked away for half a second and when I looked back it was gone. But I said fuck that and I grabbed the ball and ran as fast as I could back over. I went inside and got a drink and just didn't mention it. The next morning I asked my friend and he said, yeah bro, I say that all the time. It never does anything. It's just kind of there. Just to start off, yeah, I believe in the paranormal and all that. I also practice craft stuff. So it's fairly well a part of my life. Not to mention that I've dealt with more than my share. As of recently, I moved states to live with my family in an attempt to disconnect from the other side of my family and to basically start a new page in my book. The house I moved into has been in the family for over 40 years and a few years back, my great grandmother passed. It was sad and I missed her very much. However, I'm still unsettled about seeing her trying to get into her old room. Now my room. She hates doors and I had to put one up for privacy deals. While I was rearranging and taking some old things out of my room, I moved a brass photo frame thing that holds the Last Supper, the one with Jesus and his crew. Not Christian, please remember, no disrespect to those that are. I had sat on the floor to be hung up elsewhere in my room. I think it looks cool and like Da Vinci. It was chilling while I was putting books on a shelf and whatnot around my room when I heard loud thumping from the living room. That would be an issue if there was someone else in the house, even my cat, but it was just me. I firmly believe that was my great grandma telling me to put it back up. I did. Two to three months after I moved in, her husband, my great grandpa, passed also. They both still kind of roam the halls here and make sure things are still in check, which is fine and all. I'm just still getting used to seeing them so often. This isn't just the only few things that happen here though. The past three-ish months has been a figure that wasn't invited into the house that seems to try and spook me and my boyfriend as much as possible, going as far as scratching me a few times. There hasn't been a night since my boyfriend moved in with me that we've gotten a full night of sleep because of this thing. I know it upsets the great grandparents to a degree, as well as really goofs with the energy of the rest of the house. I've tried cleansing, removing, even going to someone with way more experience than me for advice. So it's 2am, I'm very tired right now, procrastinating going to sleep, so apologies if this is incoherent. I've never told anyone this story before because they'd probably think I'm crazy. I myself am atheist, though this memory sure raises some doubts. I've decided to believe it was hallucinations caused by anxiety, since at the time I had terrible social anxiety, along with generalised anxiety disorder. It was also during the same year I had my depression came on suddenly and hard. My parents divorced, my mom moved into an apartment, and I spent every other weekend at the old house with my dad. Now, this was in eighth grade. And I remember middle school was when the vast majority of my nightmares were about demons and ghosts. So that would also have raised my anxiety surrounding that. So probably the easiest thing to dismiss was one weekend, I saw a tall dark shadow moving out of the corner of my eye. Another time, as I was getting into bed, I saw a bald white man walk toward the wall, only for a split second. Those are whatever. People see things out of the corner of their eye all the time. Whenever my dad was out of the house and I was sitting in the bedroom upstairs, I would constantly hear footsteps downstairs. If I went downstairs to look, nothing would be there and the sound would stop. I'd go back up and into the bedroom and I would hear it again. You know the cracking sound of settling? I would hear it relatively frequently at night. 
Okay, so now I'll describe the big night that absolutely terrified me. My dad was out of the house and I was in bed upstairs trying to sleep. I heard that cracking sound non-stop every few seconds. Then I started hearing the very distinct click of the plastic cap of the string on the curtains hitting against the wall. It was very regular, like it was tapping the wall once per second. At that point I was getting very anxious and I put on my headphones and started listening to music to calm down. At the time I used Tumblr, so I was scrolling through that. Suddenly a chill went down my spine and I got a very strong feeling that I was being watched. I think this was because I subconsciously heard the garage door open because my dad did come in the room a few minutes later, but I'll get to that. Anyways, chills down my spine, feeling of being watched. Soon after that, I started hearing people talking through my music. I couldn't make out any words. It was just a man's voice, just sort of talking normally. First, I closed Tumblr in case there was an ad or something on there, but it didn't stop. Then I closed the music app, it still didn't stop. A second or so after I stopped the music, the voice turned deep and angry and honestly demonic and was yelling. At that point, I ripped my headphones off, ducked under the blankets and started hyperventilating. Maybe a minute later, my dad ran in the room asking what's wrong. I just told him I didn't hear the garage door open and thought someone broke in the house. I didn't want to say I was hearing voices. Something like that has never happened to me since. A month or two later, my dad moved into an apartment and I never had to go back to that house again, thank God. Although in one bedroom in my mom's apartment, if I'm in it at night, I would constantly hear footsteps from the kitchen downstairs. But nothing extreme ever happened, like in the original house. And now she's moved out of that and bought her own condo, so I'm completely free of haunting paranoia. I'm just sharing this because I'm curious what someone who believes in hauntings has to say about my story. Oh, and another experience that I can't explain. In sixth grade, I heard the future. Though it's actually a pretty boring story. I had a male bus driver in the morning and a female bus driver in the afternoon. One morning I was on the bus and suddenly heard my afternoon female bus driver yell, Hey! I looked around, but no one had reacted to it and I double checked the driver. It was definitely the male one. That afternoon, I was on the bus home with the female driver. At one point, a girl on the bus screamed and the bus driver yelled, hey, and it was exactly the same as the yell I had heard that morning. First off, I've never really had anything paranormal happen to me in all my relatively short life, 25 years. Being a scientist, it never really made much sense to believe in something that can't be proven. However, that all changed one night. About four years ago, I was attending a college in Southern Arkansas for my bachelor's in biology. My then girlfriend and I didn't have much money, so we shared an on-campus apartment, so our scholarships would cover the rent. This complex was on the outskirts of campus, right next to a rather large pine forest that some people went to to smoke. But you could always hear them. In between the forest and our apartment was a dirt parking lot. Our apartment sat on the first floor of the complex on the side closest to the tree line. We came back to the apartment after grocery shopping one night. After bringing all the groceries in, I decided to sit out on the patio, looking at the forest in the night sky. It was a nice spring Arkansas night with not a cloud in the sky, so this didn't surprise my girlfriend. She went inside and I sat down. As I'm listening to the whippoorwills, I notice a green light coming from just behind the tree line. It was blinking relatively slow and looked as if it was around someone's neck and that thing was digging. Not digging with a shovel, but more animalistic, like a wild boar digging for grubs. It was making no sound and seemed to be minding its own. As I'm watching this thing very intently, a car pulls into the dirt parking lot, briefly flashing its headlights over the light. At this point, the light stood up, turned solid red, and darted in a straight line through the trees, away from the car. Not like a deer running through the trees, mind you, but straight, without moving. I estimated that it probably moved about 40 to 45 miles an hour. Needless to say, 
I didn't sleep that night. The next day, I got up early and went to investigate where the light was. There was a small opening next to a creek where I estimated the light was coming from. However, there were no signs of digging or tracks of any kind. I walked in the direction the light fled to. The clearing quickly went back to being a thick understory made up of lots of scrub oak, greenbrier and limbs. I could barely walk through without getting cut up and I certainly couldn't walk a straight line. I do not know what I saw that night. I've certainly never heard of anything like this and I've never seen that light again. I talked to some of my wildlife management friends to see if they had tagged some animals with an LED collar or tag. They looked at me like I was crazy. Doing so would make no sense and would reduce the survival of the animal. So what was it? An ET? A lost spirit? A person? Or an animal? I guess I won't ever really know for certain. Since then, I've seen many other paranormal things. I've stayed in cabins where the chairs moved by themselves. I've witnessed green orbs from the sky crashing to the earth. I've witnessed spirits vocalise and speak out about possessions my friends have taken from them. It all started after seeing that light. My question now is, why? What was that light? Why did it start this paranormal chain of events? There was a family of four that moved into our neighbourhood. I couldn't figure out where they were originally from, but they looked like Asian and Hispanic at the same time. They're very good looking people, I can't explain, but you can say they're very attractive. I've not seen them go out or talk with other people, and I think it's odd that they go out all together almost every night. The two members look like a couple, and the other two look like a mother and her teenage kid. I wasn't quite sure if the teenage kid was a boy or a girl, because they look very attractive in a way I couldn't explain. They have short, silk black hair, but not very short with pitch black eyes, and a sad body posture like in a weak demeanour. At that time, I thought they were a bit weird. It was night, and I was practising and running around the block, preparing for some school competition. On my way home, I saw a weird kid sitting in their front yard, and they were holding a water bottle. I said hi, and they just nodded, so I didn't try to make conversation, and I headed home. I never really talked to my family, but they stayed in our city for at least five years. Not quite sure. Then I heard from my parents that this family is moving to a different country to their, due to their jobs. I didn't ask my parents a lot about them because I guess I was too busy with teenage stuff before, but looking back, I wish I'd asked about them more. So fast forward to this day, I moved to this country. I'm not gonna disclose this for my anonymity, but I saw the kids sitting alone at my local coffee shop. Again, I'm a rational and logical guy, but when I saw them again, I got chills all over my body. Same posture, still very good looking, and still young but dressed maturely. I don't know if they remembered me, but I look older now. I don't know, maybe this story doesn't mean anything. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but I did ask my parents about the family and they don't remember them, so I guess this is a dead end story. When I was in my 20s, I used to live in this apartment on the edge of the city. I used to walk around to explore, because if you went down to the main road, there was a long stretch where there wasn't really much except woods, fields, etc. If you kept going, though, it would become another subdivision. I should say that many weird things happened to me and my friends in this area when I lived there. I'm pretty sure it was built on burial grounds or something. Anyways... One day, I was walking down the side of the road away from the city, and I saw a sign at the end of a little gravel road that said Antique Shop. I don't remember the name of the shop, but it's irrelevant. Anyways, I remember that I had been looking for a specific item, so I decided to walk to the shop to see if they had it. As I walked down the gravel driveway, there stood what looked like an old log cabin, but it was the antique shop. A little behind and to the left of the shop, about 50 feet away or so, stood a house. The house was inhabited by the woman who owned the shop, which I found out later. I walked into the shop and it looked very old and rustic inside. I was the only one in there, except behind the counter, an older woman with grey hair. 
She immediately started talking to me and was very friendly and welcoming. Felt like I'd known her forever. We chatted for a while and I remember asking her if they had the item I was looking for. She said no. We talked for a while. I felt like I lost track of time, like we were in our own little world. After chatting with her for a few minutes, she told me I could go up to the house and ask the shop owner if she knew if they had the item. I walked up to the house and knocked on the door. A different older woman answered and I asked her about the item. I told her that the woman in the shop had told me to come up to the house and ask. She immediately got really wide eyes and had a look of fear came over her. She explained to me that no one else worked in the shop except her. I guess she was taking a break from running the shop and relaxing in the house. Still looking scared and shocked, she quickly tried to shoo me away and told me goodbye and closed the door quickly. I just walked away, not knowing what had just happened. It still gives me chills thinking about it. Who was the woman I had talked to in the shop? Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a 100 plus year old church that's been vacant for roughly 45 years or so. The church is attached to what once was a primary school that had already been restored into office spaces. This was a no-brainer since it was literally a couple blocks away from my house, under the table, and the responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day, since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I'd always see movements in my peripheral vision, but nothing was there when I'd look in that direction. This happened a lot, to the point where I'd become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later when the building became operational, as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I got a call from a tenant saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed into the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlight and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got to the basement door, I could hear what sounded like a power tool running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of a basement towards the noise. I found the cause of the noise was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure I bled all the air before I left earlier that day and unplugged it. I looked to see if someone plugged it in after me, and it's still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight started to flicker, and another unplugged power took turns on behind me. When I turned around to shine my fainting light on it, the light went out completely. I hauled ass out of the basement through complete darkness towards the door. I get out and see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks what was wrong as I'm out of breath and freaked out. I tell her what happened and she smirks and says, that doesn't surprise her. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life and tells me that as a child, she attended the school and church. She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it closed down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately committed suicide because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where a co-worker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked what happened, he said it felt like he was pushed while leaning to paint. There were even times where the movements I had always seen in there started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but nothing when I looked in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the night I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I'd always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asked me if there were any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him they were the only ones and began to lock up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps on the balcony and I yelled out, is anyone still in here? I didn't get an answer, but at this point I'm ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch was nowhere near the door. 
she would have to shut off the lights and then walk about 30 feet to the door in darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted towards the door. As I reach for the door, I hear footsteps behind me and a muffled voice say, leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside of the church. I look up and see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly look down to ensure I lock the door, and by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure was now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got the hell out of there at that point. After that night, I made sure I never entered that building after dark again. Summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose of visiting the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic, and thought it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness, families associated with many of these items, was very heart-opening, for lack of a better way to word it. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people associated haunting coming, when people own them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just being afraid of an object. Same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grieve so hard, they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but really made me feel a great connection to people I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box was not giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We were not angry or disappointed. It was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of items in there couldn't be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just typing her name, I'm not lying. And she lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, She's scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her and this isn't a building of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional though. Maybe they put her in the cage to raise your apprehension. There's a sign above her that says, if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul. So as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, Demas, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? And without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, absolutely. It said your name. I said above that I'm brave, but I was immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else with that box the whole time was terrifying, and I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation, I just said goodbye Demas, and ushered my boyfriend away from her, because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now, I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her, and saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent seeming photographs. That doll is the only item I've ever encountered that I'm sure is 100% haunted and maybe even malicious. As a clairvoyant, I've had my fair share of weird and wonderful encounters with spirits and entities. Most have been good, some bad, but I've only ever dealt with a few evil ones. This is a fairly long read detailing my encounters with the witch who tormented me for five years, in the most horrendous ways. I don't know how she found me or why she hated me, but will tell you the first time I ever saw her. 
I was dreaming I had entered into a small country pub. The ceilings were low and it had that musty smell of beer and thyme. Outside, the windows was a quiet rural lane surrounded by hedgerows and what looked like farmer's fields beyond that. It was a lovely warm day, but the scene was eerily quiet. There were two sections to the pub, one side which was devoid of anyone and what looked like a working bar, and the other side was closed off to the public and looked like it was being used to store old furniture. I found myself wandering around the furniture, admiring a beautiful antique writing bureau, and I suddenly felt disorientated. My legs started to give way as my head began to spin out of nowhere. My centre of gravity was thrown out of whack, and I stumbled onto the floor, and a fear I could not explain started to overcome me. I knew something was wrong, and had the feeling of being circled by a predator, one I couldn't see. In a state of panic, I shuffled back on the floor until my back made contact with something solid, an old dusty chest of drawers, and I tried to calm my breathing, not making any sense of why I felt like I was in so much danger. Then I heard a noise above me, a disturbing, croaky, death rattle-like sound. I was terrified, but I found myself slowly raising my head to see what was there. I couldn't help it. I shouldn't have looked, but that macabre sound drew my attention like a moth to flame. Slowly leering over the top of the drawers directly above me, a face came into view, looking down over me. It was a woman strikingly beautiful, if not cold-looking. Pale blonde curls pinned on top of her head, icy blue eyes, young, no more than 30, but her mouth was what was the most terrifying. It was stretched open into a gaping black hole, with torn cracked flesh stretching even further, making her face a disfigured, warped, horrifying mess. The rattling coming from within that cavernous abyss. I've never felt a fear like it. The sort of which strips your brain of any normal function and sends your guts plummeting. I could barely scream. I was that scared. It was more like a high-pitched hysterical whimper which barely left my mouth as her face came closer. Then I woke up sweating and still trying to scream. As disturbing as the dream was, I thought it was just that, a nightmare. Although I've never been able to get her face out of my head all these years later. Roughly six weeks later, I had another nightmare in which I was involved in a vicious assault on the street outside my home. In the dream, the police came, and as I was being pinned to the ground and arrested with the assailants, I noticed a figure walking around the periphery of the circle of police and people. As my face was being pushed into the ground, it was hard to see who it was, but they were getting closer and closer to the tangle of bodies on the floor. As the police pulled me up, I saw it was a crooked old woman, bedraggled and dirty hair hanging in her face. It was full of debris and dirt. She was in an old-fashioned white nightdress. My stomach lurched, and although she looked different, I knew it was the same woman I had encountered in my nightmare weeks before. As if she sensed my realisation, she rapidly lurched forward between the police, holding me in place and sank her teeth into my arm and disappeared leaving my arm an immediate septic mess, crawling with maggots and decaying. The pain was what woke me up. I bolted upright, expecting to see teeth marks on my forearm, as it throbbed, and although there were none in the area, it was red, as if I'd been pinched. I suspected then that these were not ordinary dreams, and that she was a separate entity, not some recurring imaginary figure. I didn't know yet that she was a witch, but the more she encroached into my dreams and life, the more I physically saw snippets of hers. She had a knack for showing herself two different ways. One, the young, beautiful woman, although never again with that hideous, deformed mouth, and the other, a stereotypical hag. Every few weeks, I would encounter her in my dreams, which was where I figured out she was a dreamwalker. As I called this gift, I'm not sure if that's the correct term, a spirit or entity that can manipulate someone's dreams. In another dream, she was standing by my bed. She had around my throat slowly squeezing until I couldn't breathe, until I woke up violently gasping for breath. I had that same experience several times. Another time on my day off, I woke up and feeling lazy decided to lounge in bed a little longer, in and out of sleep, until I became acutely aware of someone very close to me 
staring at the back of my head. I knew it was her and everything inside me screamed, do not turn around and look at her. So I stayed still, face pushed into my pillow, and then something peculiar happened. As if I was standing in the corner of my bedroom, I could see everything. Me lying in bed, covered up and face down, and hovering about two feet above my body, parallel to me, there was an opaque, brown, swirling, humanoid mass. Other times I would dream she was hovering above me, and in a half-sleeping-slash-awake state, too terrified to move. She would reach inside my chest, and I could feel an odd pressure on my heart, squeezing, causing it to beat out of rhythm. All I could do was lay there and pray that I didn't have a heart attack, as the thumping of my heart inside my chest would speed up rapidly, and then slow down, so there were seconds between each beat. I tried putting a protection boundary around my home, but it never seemed to keep her out. In the end, my spirit guide shut me down entirely to protect me from her. I guess being physically open was what kept the link going between us. The complete radio silence I had for three years was eerie to say the least, and not something I was used to as having as random spirits, popping in and out, and had been my way of life since I was 11 years old. It did the job. I didn't see her again for three years. When I became pregnant with my daughter, I unintentionally started to open up again. I only had two more experiences with her after this, although I was disheartened to know she was still linked to me. The night she showed herself again, she entered my dream as usual. I was laying in bed, and in this dream I woke and my quilt was hovering a few feet in the air above me. Through the gap in the dark between myself and the floating quilt, I could see someone shuffling around the edge of my bed back and forth. The familiar feeling of fear that came with her held me in place, scared shitless of what she was going to do next. To my absolute horror, the figure climbed un underneath the hovering quilt at the foot of the bed and slowly worked its way up over my body until she was on top of me and her face in front of mine. Her hair trailed across my skin and she smelled of damp earth. Then she spoke, you thought I was gone. She hissed at me, and all I could do was try and scream myself awake. Suddenly, the quilt dropped back onto the bed and I bolted up, right, finally awake. My quilt, which I usually cocooned myself inside, was stuffed down on the floor, between my bed frame and the wall, with the window that looked out onto the street. I refused to sleep at my home the next night, telling my friend I couldn't believe she was back after all this time had passed. My last encounter I ever had with her was odd to say the least, as it seemed as if she couldn't get as close to me as usual. Again in my dream, I awoke and she had me by the throat, both of us dangling in the air over my bed. Here, she was her younger self, porcelain skin, fair hair and all just staring into my soul as I struggled to breathe. I can't explain the look she had on her face. It wasn't anger, disgust. I don't know how... Just a cold indifference to me with maybe a hint of defeat. I felt different, and although I woke up struggling to breathe and with a sore neck, I don't think she had actually been inside the room with me. It was the last I ever saw of her and hopefully ever will. I questioned myself early on whether it was a form of sleep paralysis, but I know that it wasn't. I've never suffered with it before or since, and that explanation just doesn't seem to fit. I suspect she was trying to stop my heart or physically scare me to death, but why? As I said, I saw glimpses of her life. I know she was a healer woman in a small community, but over time she seemed to get treated with more suspicion and hatred and shunned out of the area until she was living on the very periphery of society. Maybe once respected, then feared. I have no doubt she was immensely gifted in life, but unfortunately, she passed over with them the same gifts fully understanding how to manipulate energy. Hands down, one of the few spirits which straight up terrified me. Some of this is far weirder than I would like to admit. But as I go along in each post, you'll notice the serious escalation in activity, much to my mother and sister's horror. Although I loved spooky stories, I never experienced anything myself until we moved into number 74. I swear my mother is a gypsy at heart, and we moved around a lot growing up, but this house was different. 
It was in the country, a small village, and the house was on a council estate. We had a row of garages behind our garden where people on the estate could park their cars with a few little secretive cubby holes and dens that were hidden by trees and thickets so kids dream. The very end garage owned by a local creepy bloke had been vandalised. Someone had spray painted Red Rum Believer onto his garage door. I never knew what Red Rum meant back then. One warm day, about a year after moving in, we were all 11, my sister 6. A small group of us consisting of me, my sister little Jem, my best friend Gemma, next door neighbour Kiri and her cousin Michael, were hanging out in one of our dens shaded by the trees, just mucking around as kids do, beside the vandalised garage. Michael, being a bit of a class clown, stood up doing an impression of one of our larger teachers at school. My attention was drawn to the ground where he was standing. The solid, smoothed dirt appeared to be moving like fluid. It looked like it was rippling like water. It was the strangest thing. I think it was only me that saw this. None of the others confirmed what I was witnessing anyway. What came out of my mouth next was even stranger. We need to dig there, I told them. I couldn't explain what was compelling me to say this. Something's under there. I continued. They all just looked at me and started asking why. I couldn't give them an answer besides we just need to have something buried there. I think boredom and looking for adventure convinced my friends and my sister to go along with me. So we found sticks. I had my sister go and pinch two spoons from our house, which was only yards away. And we began digging in silence this little circle of mud. They must have thought I was mad, but I couldn't explain it. I just knew that there was something under there. Kiri stops because she has dislodged something hard a few inches long. We scrape the dirt off with one of the spoons and can see it is a bone. One end is all sharp and jagged like it's been snapped. We look at each other a bit spooked, but decide to keep digging to look for more. It's probably an animal bone, Michael tells us, but this weird feeling had come over our little group. Finding more bones the deeper we go, we collect this little morbid pile and start digging a wider circle, but our finds start to dry up. I think there were about 15 bones, roughly. Some were a fair size, others small and broken. We gathered them up, and I remember putting them in a sandwich bag and taking them to school the following Monday. I plonked them on the teacher's desk and informed her we had found all these bones near my house. I'll always remember her face like a kid for really getting these gross bones off my desk. She told us that they were probably just animal bones and put them under her desk. I'm sure they probably went in the bin after we left that day. That's probably all they were, but I think it's curious that if I hadn't seen the ground moving like that, we would never have found them, and the fact it was next to the creep's garage didn't help. I only learned a couple of years later, Red Rum was murder backwards. A bit slow to catch on, I know, but it does make me wonder if someone knew something about him. We never heard any more about it. Little did I know, it was the start of something far more terrifying and long-lasting. I have always been into the paranormal as a kid. I was completely fascinated by it, and I found over the years the more open to it you are, the more downright bizarre some of the stuff you experience is. This tops my list of weird experiences. Roughly four years ago, my sister came to my flat one night to spend a bit of time with me, as we both had been working like crazy and hadn't had the time to catch up. It was like the two of us and she suggested having a game of cards, something we've always done since we were kids. It's a favourite pastime in our house. Once I had gotten the cards out and started shuffling them, she asked me to look at the time on my phone, as she had worked the next morning at 7am and needed to be home for a reasonable time. She had lost her phone on a night out a few days previously, a terrible habit that she has. I told her it was about 10 past 6 in the evening. She replied, Okay, well I'll have to be getting off around half eight or quarter to nine to get my uniform washed and dried, so keep an eye on the time for me. I agreed and we started playing a bit of rummy to start with. Now we weren't drinking alcohol or taking any drugs, we were just having a relaxed game of cards, chatting about guys and work, the usual stuff I suppose. Everything was normal, 
we played cards for what felt like two hours easy. I mean, you can't mistake that length of time when you've had about 16 to 18 hands of rummy and we're in the early stages of playing a game of poker, having got bored of the other game. I remember having the weirdest feeling come over me, like the light in the room dimmed and I distinctly felt an electrical crackly feeling start in the bottom of my spine and creep all the way up to my skull. I looked at her and she was looking at me all wide-eyed and silent, like she knew something was up. I blurted out, something is wrong, really very wrong. Without blinking or reacting in any other way, she just says to me, look at the time, which I thought was strange. I picked up my phone and looked at the time. A mixture of shock and dread creeps over me. I can't be right. It's not possible, I mumbled out loud. To myself, if anything. My phone must have glitched out or something. Getting up to turn the telly on to see what the time is on there. She's looking at me like, what the hell is going on? What is it? What's the time? She asks me again. I just repeat that it can't be right. And as I switch the telly on, the time flashes up in the corner of the screen. It said 1829. She sees it, and it's now just as freaked out as I am. Amy, that can't be right. Did your phone say the same time? I told her it did. I pull out a laptop to check the time, and even get a watch out of my drawer to see if they all matched, and sure enough, they did. We just sat there in a bit of a fog, like, what on earth has just happened? We tried to discuss it, but we couldn't make any sense of it. To be honest, it felt uncomfortable. Even to this day, to talk about it, it doesn't feel right. She breaks the silence with a joke, something like, Oh well, at least I have another couple of hours to chill with you. We just try to forget about it. I just wondered if anyone has any ideas as to what it was. A little background. This house was built in 1995 by my dad and mom. It's a big house with two floors and a basement. We were the only family that has ever lived there. My grandmother died in the bathroom upstairs in 2010. No one else has died in that house besides her. My sister and brother, who I'm going to be mentioning in the story, had moved out of the house before things ever started happening. I moved out about a year ago. It started a few years after Granny had died. We started hearing steps going up and down the stairs at night. We were spooked a little, but forgot about it soon because we just thought that it was Granny's ghosts, since she's the only one who's died there and we heard those steps very rarely. Maybe a year passes, and I'm looking through pictures my relatives and I have sent to each other, on Messenger. I found a screenshot that she had taken when we were on a video call at night, and I saw some weird grey mass behind me. I zoomed in, and was completely taken aback. There was a grey torso and face behind me in the darkness. I put some filters on it so I could see it better, cropped it because I had an ugly face on the picture, and showed it to my family and friends ASAP. Everyone except my dad was completely shocked. My dad didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and kept denying when stuff happened. My sister said that the grey apparition looks like granny and I agreed. Anyway, a few years forward. My mum and dad are downstairs cooking something in the kitchen and I'm on the second floor in my bedroom, sitting on my bed. I hear exactly three knocks on my door. It's normal that people knock on my door first before entering but this time no one opens the door to enter. I just stare at the door for a while and eventually ask who's there. I get no answer. I call mom on the phone because I'm spooked. She said that nobody had gone upstairs. I went on to Google about three knocks on the door and I did not like the answers I found. I panicked a bit and just waited until I felt like enough time had passed that it was safe enough to open the door. I went downstairs and told my mom and dad what had happened. Dad didn't believe me like usual, but mom was a bit spooked. By now, I've also seen shadows walk past my bedroom door. Creepy, but nothing special in my opinion. Again, a few years have passed and my mom and I have moved out. It's a long story about what happened and why we moved, but in short, domestic violence. Only my father lives in that house now. The house is empty and freezing most of the time because we live in Europe and father travels a lot due to work. It's also been put on sale. Since I moved out, the activity in the house has increased. My father has told my sister that he's been hearing someone walking around, faucets turning on and off, doors opening, etc. 
He didn't believe in the paranormal before, but now he's experienced the spookiest of it himself. Yesterday, my sister, mom and I had met up at the house while father was at work to just catch up. At one point, my sister informed me her and mom were planning on staying the night there and asked me if I was staying too. I declined because I hate that house and it makes me have panic attacks. Well, fast forward to today. Sister called me and told me that she was absolutely never going to stay in that house again because of what happened that night and I was lucky for choosing to go back home. Apparently, she had stayed up a bit late and at one point she heard someone walking downstairs fast and going into the garage. She thought it was mom up late so she wanted to go check what she was doing. To get downstairs, she had to go past mom's room and when she did that, she she saw that mom was sleeping. She was spooked. The steps were fast, so how can it be granny? She went back to her bed and couldn't sleep anymore, so she stayed up. After a while, she heard steps again, but this time in the room next to her. It may not seem scary to you because it's just some steps, but after years of thinking that it was our granny and then hearing steps that fast, I would have absolutely obliterated my pants and woken up mom to invisible sword fight the ghost away. Cutting to the chase. In October, we lost our dog of 13 years. Her name was Bella. And no, I didn't name her after Twilight, though it was in vogue at the time. As a two-month-old puppy, she witnessed the murder of her then owner. She was one of six pups. Ironically, her brother was adopted by my parents' neighbour. They'd ardently play through the chain-link fence whenever we visited home. I raised her in my first year alone at college. She and I were practically attached at the hip. She accompanied me throughout the six years it took to get my frickin' degree, marrying my best friend and moving across the country. I'm trying to express the depths of my love for her, and the words just fall short. Five years ago, I took up the notion that we needed to adopt a sister for her. I think this was a mildly telepathic moment, but she was eight and I figured it would be good to close out her last years with a companion. Then she started losing her fur and gaining weight. Six months after we adopted our second dog, Aria, Bella was blind. She had cataracts and undiagnosed diabetes. We were told that the $6,000 surgery might not even work, and we're too poor for it anyway. She was insanely intelligent and, after a bout of depression, coped swimmingly. One day, her breath became laboured, and I knew that our time was almost up. In the two days leading up to her death, we were literally attached at the hip. I've got a lot of experience with death and knew she was terrified. I held her in my arms as she took her last breath. After she died, I immediately started looking for a puppy. I wasn't trying to replace Bella and knew that I never could. I'd raised Bella on my own and Aria was two when we adopted her. I thought it would be good to raise a puppy together. It certainly tested my husband's patience. We adopted Lydia two and a half weeks after Bella died. She's, well, a puppy and a shepherd mixed to boot. The only way to calm her down is to wear her out. Today, while I was at work, my husband took her on a walk which made her tired. I'd just done yoga and was meditating. This is now a rarity since Lydia is always crawling on the mat, vying for attention. But today, she sidled up to me whilst I meditated. I laid down with her on the yoga mat. She was the little spoon and I the big one. Bella and I always fell asleep like this together. I was telling Lydia that I loved her and that it was nice to cuddle her like I'd done with Bella, my nickname for her. Then I talked about how much I missed Belly. As I talked to her and cuddled her, I felt the unmistakable feeling of a dog's nose nudging me on the thigh. I felt there, thinking it was Aria, but she was on the couch. It's nice to know that, even though I can't hold her, my baby's still there. I grew up in a house that was over 100 years old when we moved in. For years, I never experienced anything remotely paranormal. But when I was 13, I moved into the basement. On the first night, I didn't sleep. This isn't uncommon because I'm an insomniac, but this was different. 
My room was pitch black at night because the only window was tiny. I rolled over in the night and heard my inflatable chair. Hey, it was the early 2000s. Move. As if someone was getting out of it. I felt that someone was standing behind me watching me and the feeling didn't abate until I started to see the sunrise. I lived in that basement for seven more years and had a myriad of other experiences. I heard a man and woman arguing in the laundry room when nobody else was home. I'd set three alarms. Again, I'm an insomniac. And all three would be turned off in the morning. I'd hear whispers in my ear when I was laying on the couch trying to nap. I saw a shadow figure going up and down the back stairs, which led to the basement. But the creepiest experience happened when I was 14. If you hadn't leaned it yet, I have trouble sleeping. And this is mostly because I'm a light sleeper. Literally anything will wake me up. One night, my friends and I were having a sleepover in our basement living room. My two friends and my sister slept together on our fold-out couch. I slept on the recliner, which was in front of my bedroom door. When we woke up in the morning, we found that my friend Kristen, who'd been sleeping in the middle of the other two, was gone. My parents were still asleep, and we didn't want to wake them, so we searched the house ourselves. All of her stuff was still there. When we didn't find her, I decided to go into my room and call her parents. I moved the recliner, which was still in front of my bedroom door, propped up against it with no wiggle room. There was no other way into my room. I opened the door and there was Kristen, asleep in my bed. She had no memory of getting up in the night and she wasn't a sleepwalker. People have tried to tell me that she must have gone past me, but that's impossible. I would have woken up if she'd even walked past me, let alone if she moved the recliner I was in to open the door. My sister and I still get chills when we talk about it. My parents built their house in 1974, in a very small, very old subdivision in upstate New York. Next door, there's a three-level, three-family home that was built long before theirs, sometime in the late 1800s. This past fall, my son and I were raking leaves on an unusually warm Saturday afternoon. I enjoyed telling my son about all the trees that are still up, and how my friends and I used to use them as bases when playing wiffle ball or kickball back there. My parents don't have acreage, but they do have a pretty sizable backyard. While clearing an area by a tree found close to the back corner of the yard, I came across what appeared to be a small broom. It was severely rusted and seemed to literally be coming out of the tree, as the tree seems to be shedding some of its bark. It was very strange. I couldn't believe that it was there for a long time. Someone would have seen it somehow. Anyway, I picked it up and started feeling the bristles. They literally fell out as strings of dirt and just became a part of the ground at that point. We took the remnants of it inside to show my mom. She and my dad, who passed away nearly 10 years ago, used to live in that house next door when my grandparents owned it. During that time, she said that the Wheelers, a family living in the first floor of the house at the time, used to work on cars in that exact same spot before they built the house and put a fence up and so forth. We chatted for a while, threw the old broom away and finished raking the yard. Ever since that day, my two to three year old golden doodle literally sprints, beeline, like there's a squirrel there, back to that same exact spot as soon as we get into my mom's house, barks when she gets behind the tree, stops abruptly, wags her tail uncontrollably, and then nonchalantly strolls through the yard to find a stick do her business, or whatever it is she feels like doing. It never happened prior to that day, and now we just laugh because it's her thing to do when we get there. When I was 11 or 12, my family moved to a house in some woods, pretty close to the town. It was a lodge, a wooden house. My two brothers, sister and dad, my mom was in another, similar house next to ours, as there wasn't enough space. In the first few days, it seemed good, safe, and even freer than usual. My dad worked in the evenings, so we'd be alone in our room doing homework, chatting, normal stuff. One evening, my dad was going to stay till morning, so me and my brother got his room. 
We were in bed trying to sleep. It was about 2 a.m. when I heard footsteps next to the bedroom and thought it was my sister, so I yelled, Go to sleep, Sarah. No response. The footsteps got closer to the door and it slowly opened. There was no one there. Then I heard footsteps next to the bed. I wasn't scared. I felt safe. I felt like whatever that was was just checking up on me to see if I was okay. Footsteps stopped and the door closed. I fell asleep with a smile. I felt safer than ever. My dad came in the morning and I was already awake watching TV on the couch. My dad asked me, did mom check up on you during the night as I told her? And I found it to be a strange opportunity. I answered, no, someone else did. My dad was confused, so he asked me who it was. And I said I didn't know. We had a short laugh. The next night, everything over again. Dad stayed at work until morning. This time, I purposely stayed up to repeat like last night. I heard a loud bang on the other side of the wall to my left. I screamed, and that woke my brother up. Josh, what the hell just banged so fucking loud? I don't know. Let's check. I was excited. Josh, are you sane? It's two in the morning. I know, but I really want to know what it was. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go first in case someone breaks in. He grabbed a random broom from next to the door and we went there. There was nothing there and everything was in place. I heard footsteps coming towards dad's room's door. Wait, I yelled, knowing my brother heard it too. Josh, who are you talking to? I don't know, but I hear footsteps coming to our room, like last night. Whatever it was was next to me, checking up on me. Are you sane, really? No, no, I believe you but there's certainly a ghost in here or something. We rushed to the room and went to bed. I suddenly felt unsafe, really endangered. I felt like a sniper scope watched me. It felt so wrong. I felt safe the last time, right? The feeling of fright went through my body and suddenly a smell of blood, like something had just died. I fell asleep if someone had just strangled me. I woke up in the morning and went to make a sandwich as I was starving. I saw something run to the kitchen before me and hear a thump as if someone fell. Sarah? Mike? Ian? Dad? Who's there? Are you okay? Then I stopped. No one was there. I heard the breathing of about five people around me. I turned to say the names of my family. My dad walks in. You called, bud? You need something? No, dad. Is mom here? No, she's over at her house. Okay, um... Then I told him what was happening. He said he believed me, so we sold the houses and moved. Since then, I felt safe. I prayed every morning for three years. I was terrified. Now I'm 21 years old, and I still talk with Sarah and Ian. Not Mike. He died in a house fire. About that whenever we meet. I used to live in Libya, in Tripoli to be exact. Libya is a really rural country, but I lived in the city, which is like the suburbs in America. My mom's aunt lived in the street next to us. I always went there with my sisters to play with my mom's cousin's children. There were three girls, 12, 11, two years old at that time. I was 10 and my sisters were younger than me. I remember we were playing hide and seek. When we were about to start, the oldest of the girls just stopped talking. She looked at us and said hide, but not as in the game, but in real life. She said we have to all hide together. It was just me, my sister and her and her younger sister. We hid behind a car and said we have to peek at the rest of the street. We all looked and then out of nowhere, the whole area we were in was empty with no people or cars. To be honest, it always didn't have a lot of people, but at that time of day, which was the evening, it should have had a few people in cars, but there wasn't any. We waited for a minute and she said we had to make no sound, and then a yellow Canaro came and started doing donuts. I know this might sound kind of weird, and to make it even weirder, in Libya we don't have expensive cars, and a Camaro was really rare to see. After that, I remember me and my sister running home scared and told our parents, but they didn't think it was weird or anything. 
What made me scared was how the girls I was playing with, especially the oldest, was acting. She was looking at the car and was waiting for it like she knew it was going to happen. Now the thing that made him post this and made me remember it was that she, the eldest, died yesterday because of a car accident. A yellow Camaro hit her and killed her and the car ran away. My sister and I remembered the story and were really spooked right now. I'm 16 years old right now. If this has any importance, magic was and still is somewhat popular in Libya, especially in family fights with other families and love spells. So, to start the story off, my mother was Catholic, and my dad, who knows at the time of this story, he never really talked about it. So when this occurred, we lived in Spring, Texas. I was three years old. Weirdly enough, I remember life back to when I was around two. So we moved here when I was one, from Iowa. My dad got a new job, and we had some family down the street. So let me start with details on the house layout, so you can imagine it's somewhat better. It was a blue square looking house, which was quite poor looking. Old paint, old wood, etc. You walk into the front door, you're in the living room. To the right was a straight shot to the back door, past my room, and my mum dad's room. My room had a door that connected the two rooms also. By the back door was the washer, and an open attic where you can look up into the attic back there. Okay, now that I explain the layout, when I was three, I remember I was going outside sometime in the morning and I looked up on the way out the back door. I saw a kid, about five I would say. He just had his legs hanging off the ledge in the attic by the back door. We made eye contact, and I remember not being scared, but I was also like, who is that? Weird. And just ran out the back door. Moving on to the next, my room freaked me out. When my mom read books to me, I would fall asleep, and she would just head to her room through the connecting door. The night I had the worst feeling, my blanket was pulled down. I remember waking up in the pitch black looking down, and then right when I looked down, it ripped my whole blanket off of me. I still to this day can feel the fear I felt as a child. I screamed so loud with my heart racing, jumped straight out of bed, and went to the connecting door to my mom's room, freaking the hell out. When I brought this up to her, and she said she didn't know I had that happen, saying I was just crying and panicking until I passed out asleep. So, when starting this conversation, she told me she didn't believe in spirits until that house. She told me about nights of my dad was working. He did overnight work. She would hear someone walking through the wooden kitchen clear as day, telling me that she understood that it's old and houses creak, right? But the part that makes us weirder, the back door would get opened. Easy explanation since the house was old, but... The door had two dead bolts and one chain lock, with the door handle locked. And while alone, my mum was worried about people breaking in. She would lock all of them. And every night, all unlocked and open. And she wouldn't leave the room until it was quiet. She ended up telling my dad, but he didn't believe her, until a night he was off work and it happened. He said to my mum, do you hear that? Someone's in the house walking through the kitchen. And she just said, that's what I told you has been happening. He grabbed a bat and ran, opening their door so that you could see the kitchen and back door. No one was there. The door was still locked. I was told he looked through the whole house, checking locks and windows. No one was there. When they went to sleep and woke up, the back door was wide open, all locks off. Nothing stolen, nothing in different places. This is where my parents started getting worried. After this experience, she said with the door still opening... She was watching TV in the middle of the day. She heard the walking and she looked into the kitchen and said she knew it was walking her way. When the noise stopped, she sighed, but she freaked out when an indention of someone sitting on the cushion right next to her. When she jumped up the spot and stayed until she ran by it, then when she looked back, the cushion was slowly raising back up. She said she called a priest to bless the house that day and said I stopped screaming but still said I did not want to sleep in that room, and that the door and walking stopped after that. A 
I've told this to family and friends, and I'm always given a skeptical look, or it brings chills to their spine. It sounds far-fetched, but honestly, it was as real as it can get for me, and that's all that matters. I was around 10 or 11 at the time, and was in my old home in Millmont, Pennsylvania. It was after school, and I spent a few hours just gaming in the first full living room. It was only me and my older brother home at the time, since my parents worked second shift until around 11pm. It was around 7 or 8pm when I began to crave one of my favourite snacks. I walked in the kitchen and opened some blueberry pop tarts and sat down at the kitchen table. I was facing away from the living room at the end table. Now I need to explain the layout so you better understand. Before entering the kitchen, there's a small archway with no door. It leads straight from the kitchen to the living room, extending to around two feet of open space on either side, after the archway. From the living room continuing straight, there's a staircase to the left, facing away from the kitchen view. I was mid-bite of my Pop-Tarts when all of a sudden, I began feeling what I can only describe as dread mixed with the feeling of being watched. I kind of shook it off because of it being so random. It made no sense as to why I felt that way, so I just kept eating. It was a few more small bites in when the feeling intensified and I only had a gut instinct to turn around. I decided to do so when I shouldn't have. I'm going to try my best to describe the finite details of what I saw. When I turned around, I was immediately focused on the three quarters of a face peeking out, completely sideways on the right side of the archway. Now this face was completely solid and not transparent at the least. It was the face of my older brother Jonathan. His eyes were opened wide, unblinking, and staring directly into my own. His face had an absolutely sinister smile. An ear-to-ear smile that was almost too far stretched out to be normal. My brother's skin was normally pale, but this face was an extremely pale, being for sure a few shades lighter, almost like a slightly cream porcelain. The face's eyes were the same colour as John being bright blue, but it seemed almost glossy. It made no noise and never attempted to speak. It just stared at me, unmoving. Now I have a condition where I get heart palpitations from a murmur I've had since birth. If I'm surprised or get excited too quickly, I get several quick palpitations. I've had it for as long as I remember. When I suddenly saw that face, I had to clutch my chest as an immense immediate fear and surprise caused my heart to palpitate several times. I also got a huge lump in my throat. I couldn't scream or yell. I just stared widely back in a paralyzed terror. What was around five seconds felt more like an eternity. The face then pulled back behind the archway at an angle you wouldn't think possible. For a few seconds I was terrified, but then I just began to trying to rationally think of what I saw, in an attempt to pull myself back to earth. In my own mind, I knew it was my brother. It's just his features were a bit oblong and that smile was more sinister than anything I've seen before. I was already used to him pranking me on a weekly basis, so I convinced myself that it was another one of his stupid pranks. I thought to myself that I can also sneak to the archway myself and scare him back since he didn't walk back to the living room. I knew he was just hiding on the right side of the archway, so I slowly and silently got up from the chair and sneaked my way to the right side of the archway from the kitchen. I reached the edge of it, waited a few seconds and then jumped out and yelled BOO! However, to my confusion, there was nothing there. There was no way that my brother could have moved away from that position without me seeing, as that part of the wall only came out about two feet. I still had visible access to the rest of the living room from the kitchen. I was in shock and confusion when all of a sudden I heard a quick walk coming from the staircase on the left side of the living room. I slowly turned towards the staircase and looked up at the sight of my older brother, looking back at me with a confused expression. Dude, who the hell are you yelling at? My brother said as he peeked over the stairwell at me. He was 13 at the time. I was just in utter shock. I tried to make out words, but I just couldn't. My lip was only quivering. I instead turned back around, went back into the kitchen and sat down at the kitchen table again, just staring into my Pop-Tarts for about a minute or two. My brother came down the stairs and into the kitchen and saw the blank look on my face and pressed on his question. I told him everything I saw and he somehow believed me. Maybe due to the fear and panic I had when he first saw my face. 
I was researching online what I could have possibly seen, and I've only been pointed to what is known as a doppelganger. But I saw that they were an exact copy of a living person. That thing was very close to being exact, but wasn't 100%. I'd say 90% at best, with that stretched smile and the skin tone. Also, my research showed me that they're not sinister or evil, but can be a sign of bad luck. But I swear, the only feeling I got off of it was dread and a sense of sinister evil. I never saw it again after that day. So what exactly was it then? I have no idea. I have other experiences from my 27 years of life. But that was the scariest out of them all. And I just wanted to see if anyone has any idea what I witnessed. It was July 19th, 2016. I remember the date because we had our annual Christmas in July at my in-laws, and it was a crazy full moon. We had left to head home, we took the back way. We live in a somewhat rural area, so the back way is very dark. No traffic at that time of night, and the speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour. As we're driving along, and about five minutes from home, out of the corner of my eye towards the forest on the passenger side, I catch a glimpse of something moving fast. The moment my foot hits the brake, my wife's hand grabs my leg. Getting goosebumps as I type this, it was such a crazy experience. We come to a screeching halt in the road, and whatever it was stopped dead in front of us. It cocked its head to look at us. We both at the same time said, do you see that? It was huge. Best guess, seven foot tall, it had yellow eyes that glowed from the headlights. And it was muscular and skinny at the same time. The most memorable feature though were its legs. It 100% looked like a dog walking upright with the cocked angle in its leg. No sooner did it stop and glare at us did it continue to bolt across the road and vanish into the forest on my driver's side. The only way we've ever been able to describe it was werewolf-like. And like I said, my wife and I both agreed. If we had not both witnessed it, I'd have called myself crazy and never mentioned it. But we both saw it. No question about it. Ghost? Werewolf? No idea, but whatever it was was huge, mean looking, and fast. I had some crazy experiences when my family and I moved into our new house when I was 8 years old. The first time I noticed something wrong was a day when I was playing with my new RC car. I played with it in the living room for a few minutes, then took a break to use the computer. I left the controller on with the toy car behind me. I then started hearing an odd sound that was happening in bursts, and it sounded like a small power tool coming from beneath the house. I sat there confused looking around, but it stopped. A few minutes later, I heard it again. I turned around and noticed that the long antenna on the RC car was wiggling back and forth. The sound was the car moving by itself. Then there was a time not too long after that, I had another odd experience, and the thought of this one still makes me uncomfortable. One day, I was in the family room watching TV, and there was a computer swivel chair to my slight left in the room. Suddenly, the chair slowly turned and faced me, and it wasn't like the chair had slightly turned, it made a good, decent-sized turn. What's even more odd is that that room is known for having an uneven surface, whereas the floor is at a slight slant. The chair swiveled up against the slant towards me. A few months went by and there was a day when I had family come over and visit. It was at night and my family was in the family room across the house. I was watching TV with my brother in his room, with the TV to my left and the doorway to the hall in front of me from where I sat. He told me he was going to go hang out with the family and I told him I would join as soon as the episode finished. He leaves and I enjoy my time. But a few minutes go by and I start noticing something. The doorway is in front of me and it's dark with no light. And when I look at the TV, I can see the doorway from the corner of my eye. As I'm watching TV, I seem to notice a human-like figure standing in the dark doorway. I immediately turned my head and saw nothing there and I figure it's just my eyes playing tricks on me. I go back to looking at the TV and suddenly I see this figure again but this time, I wait slightly longer before turning to directly look at it. I noticed it was shaped like a woman who was wearing a dress, but no details other than a white shape. 
I look and it disappears. And at this point, I'm kind of freaking out, but I'm trying to convince myself it's not real. I turn to face the TV once more and the figure reappears, but this time it's moving. Her hands and arms making shapes to make some gestures. After that, I bolted out of the room and ran to my family. After that experience, I still wasn't 100% sure if what I saw was real, and a few weeks went by. One night I was hanging out with my sister in her room. Out the doorway of her room, you can see the doorway into my room on the immediate right. We were talking and joking around, until something caught my eye. There was a shadow of what seemed to look like the bottom of a dress on the floor in my room, with the rest of the figure being hidden by the edge of the doorway. It looked like the bottom of the window curtain swaying slightly in the wind. Then it moved up and out of view around the corner to the doorway. I immediately went into my room to check and it was empty. I heard no curtains nor anything fabric that could cause that shadow. I went back to my sister's room and told her what I saw. She didn't really take it seriously and brushed over the topic. Soon after, she looked at me concerned and told me, Man, you really did see something, huh? She said that my face was extremely pale. Finally, about a year goes by. One morning I awoke. I opened my bedroom door and my sister came up to me with deep concern on her face. I ask her what's wrong and she begins to tell me the story of what happened overnight while I was sleeping. She tells me that in the middle of the night, she heard what sounded like our mom outside in the hallway, softly calling out my name, James. My sister found this unusual and called my mom via cell phone to ask if it was her. My mom awoke with a groggy voice saying it wasn't her and that she's asleep in her room. My sister got freaked out and went to my mom's room where she slept for the rest of the night. Later on in the same night, my grandmother and grandfather, who live in the back house, went to my mom's room and woke up my mom and sister. They said that they heard a woman crying and screaming in the backyard. After hearing that story, it was like it confirmed everything that I had experienced. Mind you, that I kept most of those experiences to myself and didn't share them much. That was the end of it for a while. Never heard or saw anything for years. But there was one last experience. It was 2011 and I was all grown up now, still living in my mom's house. One morning, I woke up and went to the living room and began opening the blinds on the window to let the light in. As I'm opening the blinds, I hear my mom calling out for me across the house. I told her to give me a second as I finished opening the blinds. I walked to the family room where I heard her and she's not there. I assume she went back into her room and checked. She's not there. I then checked my grandparents' house. She or there are there. I went back to the living room and looked out the window and realized that all my family's cars were gone. I was home alone. I called my mom to conf further confirm she wasn't home and she indeed was not. The voice I heard call my name was as clear as day, didn't even question it in the slightest. That was the last time I came into contact with what seemed to be a woman who had interest in me. I'm not a religious man, rather I'm a man of science and reasoning, always trying to pick out possibilities before jumping to conclusions. But everything I had experienced leaves me puzzled. Everything actually happened. And even if I have trouble believing it sometimes, it's overwhelming. Back when I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend named Charlie. From what I remember, Charlie was around from the time I was about four years old up until I was nine, when my family moved to a different house. So I spent five years talking and playing with Charlie. My parents encouraged it, because I didn't have any real friends or siblings, and it wasn't uncommon for a lonely kid to create an imaginary friend to play with. I was a loner, and still very much am today. Charlie told me he used to live in my house before my family moved in. I believed him because we often played hide and seek and he knew all of the best hiding spots. He knew things about the house that even I didn't know at the time. A couple of times I asked him where his parents were and why they didn't live in the house with him and he never gave me an answer. After a year or so, he started asking me to do strange things like stealing change from my mom's purse or hiding my dad's car keys so he would be late to work. Random mischievous stuff like that. When I refused, his requests became much more sinister, telling me to push my mom down the stairs, start a fire in my parents' bedroom, etc. 
Of course, I again refused. Charlie became more cold, and instead of wanting to play, he only suggested doing things to hurt me or my parents. I was scared of him. I never told my parents what he said, only that I didn't want to play with him anymore. When we moved out of that house, I didn't bring Charlie with me. I forgot about him for many years, until a few days ago when my mother asked me if I remembered having an imaginary friend growing up. That's when all of this started to come back to me. I did some research into the history of my old house and found that there was indeed a young boy named Charlie whose family lived in the house about 15 years before mine and apparently died at a young age. But I couldn't find any info as to how or where he died. Is it a coincidence that my creepy imaginary friend and the kid who died in my house shared the same name? Why was he telling me to hurt my parents? Did I imagine him or was he a ghost? I never know for sure, but feel free to share your opinions. I'm currently 18 and have been living in my house for I'd say about 8 years now. My family, which included at the time my two sisters and my mother, moved in with my nana because of a few reasons I wouldn't want to bore you with. But for the first 10 years of my life, we lived in a house where so many unexplained things happened. Even since we moved, a few horrible things have happened there, which I won't go into detail about, possibly later. Firstly, this was before I was born and when I was a newborn. My elder sister, who was three when I was born, had a friend who she played with in the house. She described her as skinny, blonde hair, and she distinctively remembers her having a mole on her left cheek. My sister is also blonde, so when my mother saw a young blonde girl dash past her doorway, she would assume it was my sister. Only until she realised that my sister was in the same room as her. My sister would blabber on about her friend to my mother quite frequently, saying how much she liked to play with her. Another time, my mother was asleep on the couch. She said it was around 9 or 10 at night, when she awoke suddenly, a man she'd never seen before screaming her name in her face. She still says it was the most terrified she's ever been, and had called the police as well as my dad, who was at work at the time, to come home. The house was searched, but no signs of anyone. There were even times where my mother would lose her keys or phone or whatever, check somewhere, for example, the kitchen side, and they wouldn't be there. She'd go look somewhere else and then come back into the kitchen to find whatever she was looking for sat in a place she'd already searched. In my own experience at that house, I'd hear tapping on the walls, footsteps, but I am a person who thinks rationally and logically, so I pass these off. Yeah, I can't explain my personal experiences, but I'm not as clueless as to immediately say that it was something paranormal. A few years back, however, my mother got a message on Facebook from the people who moved in after we left asking if anything weird happened there when we lived at the house, so some weird stuff must have happened to them too. It's pretty depressing, because everyone in my family has some memory of something strange happening at the old house, apart from me. Well, if you don't count the tapping and footsteps, etc. But being in the house did feel unsettling, and even though the idea of cold spots in a haunted place is a bit of a cliche, there would be times where you just suddenly feel cold. Now before I continue, the stories I'm going to recite might not have occurred exactly how I described them, since both of the stories I'm going to tell happened when I was pretty young. Nevertheless, here are two stories that didn't happen to me, but happened to both my grandmother and my sister. Back in 2006, my granddad passed away and at the time, I would have been four, but as someone who has a terrible memory, I can still remember him pretty well. When he passed away, it hit everyone pretty hard, and my nan, for the first time in her life, now lived by herself. My nan used to have a queen-sized bed, which essentially had a bedside table connected to it as well, as a headrest which was big enough to hold pictures and small ornaments. So basically, it was pretty big. On the two bedside tables, there were two huge lamps which turned on and off whenever you touched the lamp itself. It didn't have a switch. One night, not too long after my granddad passed away, my nan was just laying in bed, when the lamp next to where my granddad would sleep lit up and then turned off. She brushed it off as something possibly leaning against the lamp, but then it happened again, so she was understandably pretty spooked. She decided to ask if it was my granddad and the lamp turned on. 
my nan began to cry and began to say various different things, and she was getting a response as the lamp turned on and off. She recorded it happening, but considering it was 2006, and I'm unsure what she even recorded it on, I've never seen the footage, but both my mum and nan both said that it exists. As a sceptic, when it comes to the paranormal, I hope that it would possibly make me a believer. Around 2011, my gran passed away, and at the time, she was not in a position, both physically and financially, to live on her own, so she lived with my dad right up until she passed away. My parents split when I was really young, so when we would go to see him, I would sleep in his room, which was pretty big, big enough for an extra bed, and my sister slept in another room. But when my grand passed, my older sister slept in her room from then on. One day, she opened the door to go to sleep, only to find my grand sitting on the edge of the bed. I clearly remember her running into my dad's room in tears, screaming, saying that she saw my grand. I remember my dad trying to calm her down and when he went into the room himself but saw nothing. My sister was terrified of going back there and subsequently didn't spend weekends with my dad for a very long time. I'm both grateful but also pretty annoyed that I never encountered anything like this. It probably really shit me up. I'm the sort of person who hates horror films so I'd rather not have an experience like this but then again... I always brush off stories, but I myself have never experienced anything relatable in any way. This took place over a few years in a farmhouse in the desert of Arizona. It was newly developed land. We moved into the place when I was 15. At the time, I was going through a lot emotionally and smoking a lot of weed. That might explain some of my personal experiences, so I'll try not to dwell on them too much. The house was set up almost plantation style. It was very wide and narrow. A big wraparound porch and lots of awkward corners. The front room was a tall library with an open balcony to the upstairs, which ran into long skinny bedrooms. My parents room was closest to the stairs and attached to a nursery with a sliding ensuite door. My brothers, two years younger, and my room were at the end of a dark hallway. That side of the house never got sun, so it was bad vibes all round. Downstairs, there was a fucked up Harry Potter style closet, a sunken living room, a kitchen in the centre of the house, and a sunken playroom for the baby. It honestly started the first day we moved in. My brother and I were the only ones in the house, unboxing plates. The place was so empty, everything echoed. I swear, it sounded like a little girl laughed. Like a creepy track you could get off an app or something. Keep in mind, the TVs were not plugged in. We were on an acre of land far away from the dirt road, and my brother was way too stupid to pull a prank like that. I started hearing voices at night. This wasn't unusual. I honestly used to freak myself out so badly. I think I made up noises to scare myself. My parents had raised me not to talk about things scaring me, to tough it out and be a big girl. It was fine most of the time during the day. Everything came at night. I remember distinctly when it started messing with me in bed. In solidarity, my brother and I kept our bedroom doors open for the hallway's nightlight, and in case we needed to call for each other. We had a pretty fucked up childhood, that might have contributed to all the codependency I'll describe during this. I was falling asleep, but not quite out. I felt the blanket slipping off the bed and reached down to grab it. This was common. I didn't have a bed frame with a foot. It kept slipping no matter how I tried to tuck it. In classic horror movie fashion, the last time I pulled it, I felt tension. There was nothing it could have been caught on. I feel like the second I went from confused to terrified, it bounced back to me. I don't know how to explain this well, but I was sure someone was under the bed pulling it from me. Later, I moved another nightlight into the bedroom. It was a kind of spooky amber orange and I convinced my parents to let me paint the walls cherry red. Again, I was almost asleep, but not quite asleep, so I don't think it could have been sleep paralysis. I heard the carpet rustle and maybe joints cracking. It sounded like my mom had come to check on me. I opened my eyes and immediately froze. 
I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. There was a woman crawling across my floor, from the far side of my room to the foot of my bed. She was pale and stringy-haired like she was going bald. I couldn't see her face. I don't know how I fell asleep. I couldn't scream or move. I think she disappeared under my bed. Again, this could be her hallucination. My baby brother was about seven months old when she started coming out during the day. My mum was a teacher at the time and was able to stay home with us during summer vacation. It was lunchtime. We were watching a movie quietly downstairs while the baby napped. There were noises upstairs like something dropped to the ground. We listened for a second before my mum ran up. She thought the baby had fallen out of his crib. We opened the door and found him asleep. There was some weird shit on the floor. It took us a while to figure out it was drywall or something. There was a crawl space to, to a small attic where the AC and insulation could be reached. It was barely big enough to get into, a good nine feet from the ground. It also had to be pushed up and slid over to open. There was a visible gap. The carpet was a really ugly dark blue, so we could see white fucking spots on the ground like something was dragged from one side of the room to where the crib was. It stopped right in front of it. My mum checked the closet and called my stepdad. He couldn't leave work, so we stayed downstairs until he got home and checked the crawl space. We, we have never had animals. It's really difficult for most things to live in Arizona, so wildlife is pretty rare in that area. He didn't find anything or signs of anything living up there. This happened every day for two weeks. We really didn't know what to make of it. My mum thought it would be the AC suctioning the opening up. It stopped and didn't happen again for two and a half years when my baby sister was born and stayed in the same crib. Again, it happened on and off for a few weeks and never again. The AC never popped that opening open again. To keep my own solo experiences brief, I had a period of three months where I straight up didn't sleep. I went crazy. Every night, I felt like my bed was shaking. The instant I laid my head dead, it would vibrate. The metal frame would sway. I'd feel like someone was pushing the mattress between the baseboards or sitting on the corner. I had my brother touch the frame one night to tell me if the shaking was in my head or not. He said it wasn't but I'm not sure if he was just playing into it. I thought I might be having seizures or something. At one point, I got so frustrated, I started sleeping on the couch downstairs with the dog. I started hearing whispers too. Not a noise that sounded odd, but someone calling my name. My name has three fucking syllables. I would be in my room, door open, doing something at night after my parents went to bed. It was a female voice, but it sounded off. I don't know how to explain it. The downstairs really scared me after the lights went out, so I never went down, but I did walk to the balcony to look down. I never saw anything, but the whispering would stop when I got close. My brother started hearing it too. He's kind of weird. His life's dream has been enlisting in the army, so his reaction was always getting his knife and walking right downstairs to confront it. He'd turn on the lights and look around before coming back up. He slept on my floor a few nights because he was convinced she wanted me. We had prior haunting experiences, which led to my parents making jokes that the ghosts follow us. They didn't pay much attention to it at this time when it was quiet. One night, my parents went out with the babies. My brother and I were in our rooms, doors open per usual. We started hearing something weird. I thought it was the wind. It got louder until it was clear a woman was fucking wailing. I know it sounds crazy, but it was so clear. We hid in my room for what felt like hours calling my mom. For some reason, it didn't occur to us to call the police. The crying stopped. We had to plan to run for the stairs and out the nearest door. All of the lights were on in the house and my brother had his stupid knives. It's like it knew we were going to leave. We heard shuffling outside the door and maybe breathing. It could have been the air conditioning. We kind of decided that we were ready to die, unlocked the door and booked it. The crying started again and it was clear it was in my parents' room. We stood outside the property line for an hour, waiting for them to come home, watching the house. 
No one could have gotten out without us seeing. We had huge windows lining the upstairs hallway that showed everything with the lights on. My parents made fun of us and still do about that night. A few other incidents include my baby brother talking to the man upstairs. He'd stand in front of the balcony and talk up to someone. He told us the man was hiding in my room. We talked about the man in the window and would ask, who's that? Direct to the doors at night. I don't want to talk about all of it, but there were so many instances of voices, doors slamming, and things being knocked over in my room. I thought I was losing my mind. I moved out at 18 and come back occasionally, usually to babysit. Apparently, my reluctant believer mother and absolute skeptic stepdad watched a coffee pot jump off the counter. They also were sitting outside having a fire open evening when they saw a figure in the balcony window of their bedroom. It was a tall man, but my stepdad still needed urging to go upstairs. It appeared a second time, closer to where the nursery door was. My mom said she had horrible dreams about a man in the corner of her room after that. She was present for many of the times we heard footsteps upstairs, doors slamming when the AC was off, etc. But she always denied there being anything wrong. My parents left town with the kids for a week. At this point I was 19 and happily living an hour away. My mom begged me to check on my brother and stay a few nights for the weekend. I arrived during the evening after I got off of work. I asked how it had been alone. He said he was fine, he just didn't go upstairs at night and minded his business. He said if he ignored it and tried not to get scared, then it ignored him. He felt safe with the dog. We were watching YouTube and eating when we started to hear a deep noise. At first I thought it was a bike or one of the small buggies people drove out there and I noticed it was holding a tune. It was humming. The dog had a weird thing about staring into the bathroom if the door was open, which was scary at night. This time the door was closed and he still stood up and stared. The noise was so deep it sounded like it couldn't be human, but it was definitely melodic. There's nothing I could figure out to explain it. My brother and I just kind of looked at each other. Then a door slammed upstairs and we decided to fuck off and go on a walk. When we got back, I decided I would sleep in my parents' room. It didn't feel right to stay in the kids' room, but looking back, it would have been best to stay close to my brother. I fell asleep surprisingly easy. I guess about two hours passed before my brother slammed the door open. The house smelled like it was burning. Not really like a fire smell, but like a burning plastic and trash. I was panicked. I was the adult and didn't know what to do. We checked the house. I turned off the air conditioning thinking it might be on fire. We opened all the windows and fell asleep on the couches downstairs. The next day, the smell was still lingering but less overwhelming. The air conditioner was fine when I turned it back on. Like usual, the day was fine. The next night, my brother and I went on a jack-in-the-box run. It might have been taken 30 minutes. We arrived home to a mess of blood, vomit and shit. The dog was sick all over the living room. We immediately took him to an emergency vet, certain he was dying. They checked him for everything they could and gave him a clean bill. When we got home, all hell broke loose. My brother and I were cleaning up the mess with the doors open for airflow. There was absolutely insane banging noises from upstairs. We hadn't locked up on the way out. My brother thought someone had snuck in and was trashing the upstairs. We went up to check and I hung downstairs ready to call the police. Nothing happened. Nothing even seemed out of place. We kept cleaning but the noises started almost immediately. It kind of sounded like someone was shouting behind a wall of cement. I couldn't tell the gender. My brother told me he had been fine until I got there. I could leave if I wanted. I totally did. And I didn't go back. My parents sold the house this year. During the in interim of the move, they stayed in an Airbnb. My brother lived really close to his work, so he stayed in the house with the dog for a few weeks. This story is just his own, so I'm still not sure if I believe it. He's kind of weird, but not one to embellish. He had been hearing the usual things, even his name being called in the night, but ignored it all. His friends had been coming over to sleep, keep him company. The last day he was supposed to finish moving, he brought a friend. He says he felt they were being watched the whole time they cleared the place out and his friend left him to lock up. 
They got into the car facing the house when they noticed the blinds were open. They were definitely closed on the way out. His friend claims he saw them open from the side of his eye. My brother says there was a woman squatting in front of a downstairs window, close to where he had just left from. She was pale, her nose was hooked, and her hair was black and stringy. Again, classic horror movie ghost. He said she had black eyes with visible white dots in the middle, inside out eyes as he called them, as she was smiling. He says it took him a second of shock to realise she was looking right at him. He felt sick, like she could walk right out and get him. The burned rubber when his friends snapped out of it and they screamed at each other all the way down the road about what they saw. He called me right after to explain it, but I was with friends and not really willing to listen. What fucks me up is that my mom thought he had a psychotic break. He went into his room and cried all night at the Airbnb. She thought something happened with his girlfriend. My brother isn't a crier. I haven't seen him do it since we were little. When we got together and talked about it, his eyes teared up then too. He said he didn't know why, but he knew she wanted to kill him. He drew a picture of her. Let me know if you're interested in seeing it. It's not great, but it still fills me with the deepest foreboding. It took me a while to realise that I saw her too. Just once in my bedroom almost five years ago. Seeing her suddenly made sense. I knew it didn't feel like a woman, but it felt feminine. It felt like something pretending to be a woman. Anyways, I know this is long. Feel free to offer your opinion. My ex brought this up today. We dated all through high school and had a few experiences together that she recounts as her only paranormal encounters. I'd love to still think that this was my own delusion, but it was shared by too many people to be. Maybe a few things are explainable, but most of it isn't. It's affected me so deeply, I'm still terrified that if I think too much about her, she'll follow us a state away. I also forgot to mention we heard word from neighbours that the previous family had 12 people, Mormons, living in a house we could only fit six into. They were really weird according to multiple families and they moved in with five kids and left with four. We heard a toddler drowned in the upstairs bathtub. No idea which one or if this is true. We couldn't find any documentation. To start off with, I've always been a sensitive person, to the point that I'm highly susceptible to migraines, sun sickness and car sickness. Not only are my regular senses heightened, but I could be headed to have sixth senses. I always say that this is a family thing, but I can't actually remember who told me that, when or why. That said, I've always been able to kind of feel people's energy in the form of emotions, and had a bit of an awareness of electromagnetic energy, able to tell when a CRT TV was on anywhere in a house, but most relevant to this, I've always been sensitive to the supernatural. I also usually don't dream, though dreaming has become more common in adulthood, but I attribute that to less consistent sleep, as I must often dream only if I fall back asleep after waking up. As a kid, I remember I was afraid of the dark because I always felt like I saw things in it. But that was very likely my imagination, as I remember that I didn't have a strong ability to differentiate my imagination from reality until I was about eight. I remember around 12 I had an out-of-body experience, but that wasn't really ghostly. Around 14 or 15, I had a very active autumn. On Halloween, I saw three shadow people in one night, one watching me from a fence, one behind an above-ground pool while playing hide-and-seek. And I can't remember the thirds, but I remember there were three. This all happened at my father's best friend's house during a Halloween party, and I remember people saying I must have seen someone in costume. But the more you think about it, the dumber that sounds, because shadow people really just don't look like people in costume. A week or two later in November, I was out late in an appointment with my mother, and we were walking back to the car. The building had lights on the sides and I was trailing a few feet behind my mother. It was a short walk but at one point I just looked down at my shadow and noticed the second one next to mine, almost twice as long and maybe a foot wider. I looked over my left shoulder to see where it was coming from 
But as I did, I heard a rustling in the bushes about five feet to my right. Turning around, I didn't see anything there or in the bushes and the shadow was gone. I freaked out and ran with my mom to the car. I can't remember clearly if I definitely saw shadow people any time in the future after that, but I think I did. The next major things I experienced though were my Uncle Frank. He was a very well respected man, and not just my godfather, but felt like the godfather, with the way he was treated and the way he carried himself. He had a position high up in American Airlines, and he passed away in 2012. I remember being told that the plane carrying his body back to New York made two trips around the city before landing. I think he landed at JFK, but I don't know for sure. During this time though, I was 17 and attending Stony Brook University, so I had to get picked up and brought home for the funeral. I only had one pair of dress pants that I brought with me, and before we threw it in the wash, we emptied the pockets. But when I took the pants out of the dryer and stuck my hands in my pockets to open them up, I found a freshly minted $20 bill. I still have it pressed into a book in my pocket. Every time I saw Frank, he'd give me money like that. So finding that 20, I just started crying. Frank is an active spirit and I know he's done a few other things, but only one other stands out in my memory. This spring, my cousin Gina got engaged to her longtime boyfriend, Rory. Rory knew about Frank, of course, but I don't think they ever met. And he said that after Gina said yes, they had commented, I wish I could have asked your grandfather, Frank, for permission. They swore that immediately after they said that, a rainbow appeared out of nowhere. When I spoke to my mom about how I can't remember more Frank stories, she assured me that people like him are always around and said she still feels her father around all the time. I asked her about this because she's never mentioned this to me before and she was surprised she hadn't. So I'll share what she said now. Whenever I'm looking for something in the garage, I usually have trouble. So if I can't find something after a moment, I just say, okay, dad, where is it? And suddenly it would appear. I found this a very interesting story for a few reasons. One, my grandfather died long before we got their current house. So kind of funny he'd know where anything in that garage is. And two, my mom has always had a talent for finding things no one else can. And I've joked about her being able to find anything for years. I wonder if that's just because of her dad. The last thing I have to mention it's not really fun at all, and I still don't know how to explain it. So me and my fiance moved into our apartment last June, and we went to her family's Thanksgiving together for the first time ever that year. So on the way there, we went through a neighborhood I've never seen before. And the second we entered the neighborhood, something was very, very wrong. I'm starting to cry and sweat cold just remembering this, but I can't explain it very well. I was just sitting there, and all of a sudden I got a chill. Something was focused on me, a very strange presence. I couldn't say where or what that something was in that neighborhood. It took us about seven minutes to get from one side to the other. My fiance was terrified, not because she felt anything, but because I was crying, a horrified mess, complaining to her about something watching me. Something felt like it was out to get me. I'd never been so scared in my life. We went to my parents after we left her family's house so we've never gone back to that neighborhood and I wasn't paying attention to where we were going so I'm not sure where it was but I don't want to ever go back there again. It's a really hard thing to explain that sudden sensation of not being watched but almost haunted. I'd never felt anything like it before and I never want to feel it again. I never saw anything. It was about three o'clock so not even dark out and it seemed like a normal neighborhood but I swear on my life that something was there and it felt like it was out to get me for the entire time we were there. So I live in the tropics of Australia. My house is situated in a remote part of the Daintree Rainforest. I live in a house that sits on stilts in a Queenslander. And from my bedroom window, it's about a three to four meter drop. My closest neighborhood is about one kilometer away or 0.62 miles. I don't live on a main road. However, I'm close to a creek. There is literally no one near me. This only happened around two nights ago. I was alone in my house, except for my cockatiel. I was sitting in bed watching some TV, 
nothing out of the usual. I then got that all too familiar feeling of someone watching me or something's about to happen. A feeling that I've gotten accustomed to over the past 20 years. At that point, I heard the tap running in the kitchen, which I thought was strange. So I got up, went to the kitchen with my phone's torch as my only guidance. I didn't want to wake my bird by turning the lights on. I've gotten used to these type of things happening, and I'm not really all that scared of them anymore. However, as I turned off the tap, my wall clock did its Westminster chime. I looked over and the time showed 12.38am. This straight away caught my attention as I only set the clock to chime every hour. Then, as I was near the clock, the tap turned back on full force. I jolted, quickly looking in its direction. I went to turn it off. There was condensation all over the handle and all over the window that sits above the tap. The tap was freezing cold even though the water coming out was boiling hot. My bird at this point was now awake, due to my clock as it was, had just chimed a second time, roughly 12.44. I quickly got my bird and brought him back into my bedroom with me. I left the kitchen and the clock, so I just couldn't be bothered to put up with what was going on. My poor bird was scared shitless. I kind of admit I was too. As I sat in my bed, there were three knocks on my bedroom door. When I ignored them, they moved to my window. I got up and opened my curtains to nothing but trees and the black as ink sky. I opened up the window and my god, I'm getting goosebumps writing this. I heard whispers at the bottom of the ground, far below me. I couldn't understand what they were saying. Then they stopped. As soon as they stopped, three knocks yet again hit my door. I slammed my door shut and locked the door. I yelled out, can you please just leave me in peace? They stopped. Nothing else happened that night and I finally got some sleep. It was really creepy, not too scary, but scary enough to give me some trouble sleeping. It was one of the last weeks of Christmas holidays in Oz and my family was getting ready to move out of our Queenslander. The experience happened within a week. The last two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, I had two mates over for a sleepover. The first day of this experience, previous Friday, my grandfather was looking after me. The house was a general layout. There's a long hallway, four bedrooms and two bathrooms that branch off from said hallway. At the bottom of the hallway, there's the kitchen, lounge room and dining area. There's a second small hallway leading from the kitchen out to the back deck. This back deck sits far higher up than the backyard, like a giant balcony looking over the backyard. It's worth mentioning that a spare bedroom branches off from the top of the main hallway. This is where the latter of the story is. I should also mention that I had a fascination for electronics. I still do. So I had electronic train sets, and I also had a security system, only three security cameras, because I liked playing around with the switchboard. Friday. My mum and dad had left early for work, so I woke up to the smell of crispy bacon and egg breakfast sandwiches. My grandfather always believes that breakfast is the most important meal and never settles for anything that doesn't have sausages, eggs, or some sort of breakfast sandwich. I slowly stumbled into the kitchen, still half asleep, gazing upon my steaming hot meal on the table. Well, are you gonna sit down and eat? It isn't gonna eat itself. For my grandfather's query, I sat down and ate. So did he. We had a bit of a discussion. He said that we would go to the corner shop in the afternoon, but he wanted to watch the midday races, which is code word for he wanted to sleep for three hours after lunch. After breakfast, I played with some Lego and played with my dog, etc. Nothing really happens until after lunch and my grandfather is asleep. So let's skip to then. With my grandfather snoring loudly and reclined in his chair and I bored with races, I decided to go down into the backyard and say hello to the cockatoos. My neighbours at the time had a pair of sulphur crested cockatoos. Their cage was outside, down in the middle of the neighbour boundaries, but we didn't mind. I walked down to the cage that sat under two huge avocado trees. Hello Bluey, hello Bluey. The pair knew my name. As I visited them often, they were honestly quite cute. 
I sat on my little wooden stool I had there and just admired them for five or ten minutes, as well as listening to the magpies flying high above. Then I got that feeling, the feeling of someone watching, that feeling that something is going to happen. Out of instincts, I look behind me and up towards the deck, just barely being able to see the back door due to perspective. After seeing nothing there, I turn back around to the cockatoos. This is when things become hectic. Only 10 seconds after I turned back around, the crests upon both cockatoos rose simultaneously to their full length. They flattened their body feathers and stood up straight. Cockatoos and cockatiels do this behavior when they're mostly curious, shocked, surprised or worried. They started to absolutely scream. They started to shout my name, their owner's name, and also started to native scream. I was now in shock. I didn't want to turn around, I was frozen. Until I felt an icy cold breath on the back of my neck. I instantly turned around from feeling this. I see nothing. While looking behind me, the front leg of my stool just snapped. I fell forward, face planting into the ground. At this point, the cockatoos have started to fly around in their cage. I stand up quickly, frozen again. Then, in the side of my hair, I hear Bluey. It was quiet and sounded like an old, angry man. I felt his breath touch the outside of my ear. I started to sprint. I got no more than a metre when I slipped and fell down onto the ground from a fallen, rotten avocado. I tried to get up, but of course, I badly rolled my ankle. As I tried to stand up, I heard a scream, and I'm in a full-on scream, burst into my left ear. Bluey, run! Yet again, it sounded like the same old creepy man. I was stumbling, almost hopping towards the stairs to get up onto the deck. I was probably going a little faster than walking speed. After reaching the top of the deck, I made the last hobble towards the back door. It was locked. I started to absolutely scream for my grandfather. I was banging at the door, just yelling as loud as I humanly could. I saw my granddad through the large glass pane rushing towards the door. He pushed it open, but it slammed back into his face, causing the glass pane to shatter into huge shards. Then it stopped and let the door open. Nothing really happened after that. However, my granddad thought it would be best if we spent the rest of the day in his house. Tuesday to Wednesday. I was still in shock from Friday, but today was the day that two of my good friends came for a sleepover as I was moving cities. Lucas and James arrived around one o'clock. We did the usual things, played in the backyard, hung out in the small wooden tree house that my dad built us. It sat about halfway up on one of the many avocado trees we had in the backyard. I did get that creepy feeling that I got on Friday and I wasn't totally comfortable playing around in the yard. But I had my friends there, so I thought it was okay. It was around six o'clock when my dad told us to come inside for dinner and to bring Fletcher inside. Fletcher is my dog. We always bring him inside of a night. We went and fetched Fletcher. He was sniffing around some deer holes, as lots of schnauzers do. We came into the kitchen and sat down for nachos. We decided to watch a couple of movies, play some Wii, and then go to sleep in the spare bedroom. It was probably 11 o'clock. My parents were in bed and fast asleep. The three of us had just finished watching our third movie and decided we should probably head off to bed too. We shambled up the long, narrow hallway with Fletcher guiding us. We finally reached the spare bedroom. Inside sat a TV, my switchboard for the cameras, a queen and a single bed. The three of us sat on the queen bed as James wanted to have a look outside. So I turned on the TV and the camera system set up. I switched to channel one, the front camera. They had night vision, but as you can imagine, this was around 10 years ago, so it wasn't the best night vision around. But it wasn't very clear. I continued to switch to the second camera, channel two. It pointed towards the driveway, then to the third, which looked down into the backyard. James thought it was awesome. Lucas wanted to sleep and at this point, I was so tired that I really couldn't care less. James took control and switched through the channels, thinking he was some sort of security guard. Then, some static took a hold of channel two. Bluey, what was that? Bluey? It was just a bit of static. It happens sometimes for James. 
Fletcher at this point went next to Lucas, the both of them pretty much asleep on the Queen's bed. I was in the single, making sure James didn't stuff up the setup on my desk. It was at this point where I got that feeling again. I desperately wanted to turn on the bedroom lights, but I didn't want to seem like a wuss. So instead, I leaned in closer, now watching each cam very carefully along with James. Fletcher, what are you doing? I'm trying to sleep. I turned around to see Lucas disgruntled and Fletcher no longer sleeping, but instead standing up on the bed. His ears were pricked up. He was slightly leaning forward, putting pressure on his front legs. Again, this is a common defense and a attack stance for a schnauzer. He started to growl. I was now fully alarmed. So was Lucas and James. Static had not taken over the camera system. Lucas put a chair up against the doorknob. James get up and shut the blinds. James scrambled up from the office chair. Lucas grabbed one of the two chairs at my desk and quickly put it against the door. I sat down and rebooted the system in quite a panic if I may add. After rebooting, there was no longer any static. I quickly put it onto channel three to look at the backyard. Sure enough, I could barely see the cockatoos flying and going wild in their cages. I muttered, oh no. Me saying this absolutely freaked the hell out of James and Lucas. They turned to a puddle of mush. Well, what's wrong, Bluey? Well, I'm pretty sure we're gonna find out soon enough. Static no longer filled the camera system, no. Instead, the lenses started to fog up. I could no longer see out of channel three. Quick, quick, go to channel one. There's no point, James, they have all condensation on them. At this point, Lucas was very quiet until he said, guys, someone just poked me. Lucas was on the queen bed, James was on the single, and I was sitting in the office chair. James and I went into the queen with Lucas. The three of us sat huddled. We grabbed Fletcher, still growling towards the door. The three of us watched the camera. We would see faint shadows moving around. I went to turn on the bedroom light. You guessed it, it wouldn't turn on. Then the camera went to static. I changed the channels, nothing, all was static. I rebooted it twice, nothing. Then a cackle was heard. I jumped back into the bed. The cackle went again. At this point, James was on the brink of tears. I felt another breath on the back of my neck. It sent spine tingling shivers throughout my body. Lucas peeked through the blinds. The window had conversation all over it, but that wasn't the problem. Lucas mumbled, oh my God. Written on the outside of the window was end. That window has nothing beneath it, except the ground, which was three or four meters below. Lucas quickly crawled back from the window, back to the middle of the room. Fletcher stopped growling, but now instead was whimpering. Just as he started to whimper, we heard a single tap at the window. Then nothing. Fletcher quickly looked towards the door and sure enough, we heard footsteps slowly coming closer from the hallway. Then the footsteps stopped right in front of the door. Silence for 10 seconds. Fletcher began to absolutely cry and for good reason. Three loud knocks were hit with a large amount of force on the door. Then again, silence. Until rapid tapping on the window took place, a rock then got thrown at the window, smashing it. We started to absolutely scream, moving the chair, trying to pull open the door. Then the same voice screamed in the room, you're wanting to leave so early, I'm that bad of a host. The door flung open, an inertia effect happened and we all fell flat onto the ground. We got up and ran screaming down the hallway. We bolted past a mirror that shattered as we went past it. My parents were now awake and as soon as they stepped outside of their room, it all stopped. James and Lucas went home early and thankfully we moved out of that house three days later. However, the next morning we saw the true aftermath. All three cameras had been ripped out. Only thing left were wires coming from the roof. We never found the cameras. The window had somehow been smashed and the two meter long mirror was in ruins. I never really found out who the spirit was, but he was definitely aggressive. The house wasn't too old. I think it was built in the 1940s from what I can remember. Both experiences were terrifying and I've never owned security cameras again due to the fear of what I may see on them.
This story happened many years ago, around the months of July and June. My family and I often vacationed up at a cabin in Yungambura, Cairns, Australia, during winter. We do this as we miss the cold days we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungambura is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that, if you blink, you miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 plus years of heritage. As usually with rich heritage in small towns, local folk legends form over the years. One of these legends came true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands and was next to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land, including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up to a somewhat steep dirt road that also lead to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium sized pond that ran along it. The dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungabora. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungabora. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, didn't have to drive anywhere the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 p.m. and I decided I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about five degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper and that was all. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway. God, did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was up. After I had my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first, it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog. Then it surpassed heavy fog. Thereupon, I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, here we fucking go. Something's about to happen. Get it over and done with. On recollection, I believe I actually said that out loud. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom. The last thing I wanted was to fall in it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mum. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed her light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up steps and I heard a door open, so I knew I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction I saw it last. I was calling out to my mum to turn it back on. There was no reply. Until I finally ran into a wooden guardrail and some steps. I walked up the steps and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying upon in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There's three things you do in this type of situation. The three Fs. Flight, fight, freeze. I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mum's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorsteps of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, my son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. I took a chunk out of my knee and cuts all along my hands. I still have the scars. I turned around and realized I hadn't tripped over a stone. I tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed. I got up and started to run even more. I was screaming out for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. 
I thought I got far enough from the house until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the medal at the end was my life. Before I knew it, slam. I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over and perhaps give me some insight into what I saw and what my dad saw. Me and him sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first built late 19th century. During the 1910s, a well-known mother, Anne, her apparent name was, let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late. As it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps. She told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she wasn't accompanied by her son. It was not until the next morning, they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late cold darkness, mistaking them for her own son. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late twenties and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets its coldest in Toowoomba and that night I remember it reaching minus four degrees Celsius or 25 Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark's a teacher there and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what happened. He said in his shaky voice, he's here, a ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak it. Downlands is a boarding school, so I know there was a small amount of people still here. However, the boarding block and admin block is a far, far ways apart. And I wasn't about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. As we were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers, the wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden, it got really warm, and I mean a quick, sudden boost in temperature. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see who was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think of it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds. It felt like five hours then. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over to the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up. I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running towards a road until him and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block and find another member of faculty. We reached the block. We found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told, it's a common thing to see if you stay in the admin block too late or if you're walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams at least once a week as he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. Apparently, the faculty member, who was also a teacher, said he had only seen the burning man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, 
he replied with, all the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, the fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her 30s. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, but we just wanted to ask if you had ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe late 60s, early 70s, came back out from the back and said, you two saw the burning man, didn't you? Mark replied, yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came close and said, yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a times. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late. If you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left. Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. The Burning Man at Downlands College has been noted as one of Toowoomba's most minacious paranormal experiences. In my late 20s and last month, I had one of the most scariest experiences I've ever had. My family attracts spirits. As in the 18th century, some of my family dabbled in some of the spirit stuff. They got blamed as witches and they got burned at the stake. That's a story for another day. Anyway, I was on a four wheel drive adventure with my dad, mum and my dog. We have a buffed up Pajero. Not the best four wheel drive, but it still makes it across desert tracks. It was on the 12th of December, I believe. We were crossing a track in the Northern Territory, Australia. We had just finished crossing a rocky portion of the track and was now on flat dirt road. We started to set up camp for the night. As I stepped out of the car, I went around the back to the water containers to fetch some water for my dog. But as I walked near them, I heard a trickling and gushing noise. Sure enough, a rock had punctured both external water containers. I quickly went and told Dad we had barely enough internal water to last us a day. So we made the decision to drive at night. You should only really drive at night if you most definitely have to. Otherwise, you should generally avoid it. We knew there was a small community just outside of Yundumu, around 45 minutes away. It was already 7.15 and pitch black. We got in the car and started to drive. This road was particularly dangerous as it was long and straight. People often fell asleep and drove off the road doing 110 kilometers an hour. We were about halfway there. I was sitting in the back with my standard schnauzer on my lap. He was drifting asleep until his ears pricked up. He then jumped up. It looked like he was trying to look behind us. I turned around and saw nothing but a black, empty, eerie desert. I turned back to the front to see my mum drifting to sleep and my dad wide awake. Then all of a sudden, my dog started to whine really loud. A really bright light was reflecting in the side mirrors and rear view mirror. My dad said, what, is that a car behind us? I looked behind us. There were two extremely bright lights tailgating our car. At this point, my dog was barking and whining. My mum had woken up and immediately started to panic. The lights continued to tailgate us for the next two minutes. We then passed a tree and all of a sudden the lights had stopped. The car was no longer behind us, it had disappeared. My dad stopped the car, he turned it around thinking the car may have crashed. We got near the tree, I got up on the roof, turned on the giant spotlights we had fitted for this trip and shone it all around us searching for the car. There was no sight of it, just empty red dirt. We searched for another 15 minutes, even on foot, nothing. So we continued on with the drive, hoping to find some help in the coming community. Once we reached the small settlement just outside of Yuendumu, we raced into the pub. The pub was ex empty except for the bartender. He immediately asked us, what's wrong, something up? My dad replied with, we were just driving along the track. We saw a car disappear off the road. Someone could be hurt. The bartender put down his rag and said, you guys saw the Northern Nissan. No one's hurt. At least not now. I replied in a somewhat impatient tone, what do you mean? Someone could be hurt. He then pointed to a news article up on the wood wall. It read, Nissan crashes into tree, killing all two on board. 
What you saw was the ghost of the northern Nissan. It crashed a belt a bit more than a decade ago. It was two brothers, quickly making their way into town as one of the brothers was sick. They crashed into that tree at about half past seven. Many people who make that road at night see them at around the time you guys saw them. My mum's mouth had dropped. My dad sat down. We stayed in that small settlement for the night. In the morning, we decided to go look at the tree. What we saw was a scar from a crash and exactly where we saw the car disappear the night before. It was creepy to think. I got out on foot searching for a ghost car seconds after it had disappeared. My family had seen the northern Nissan. This was around five or six years ago. I would say I was a skeptic, but not adverse to the idea of ghosts. I worked in a nursery, kids, not plants, and the building itself used to be a hospital for tuberculosis. The baby side of the nursery was in the old morgue for the hospital, not my side. I'd never heard anything in that building in the nursery, but numerous girls, staff, had said they had seen a woman walking around the baby's nap room in the old morgue. But when they ran in, it was empty. It had a video monitor, so they would see her on the black and white screen. The older kids were in the old hospital. Anyway, I had covered many times in the old morgue and had worked in the old hospital side for three years without any incidents or hearing of any incidents. One night though, when I had moved to the office, not working with the kids anymore, I had a few things to finish up when the nursery was closing, so I spoke to the manager and got their keys so I could close. The owner lived in a house right behind the nursery and there were houses all around. Also, again, I'd worked there three years and was often the person, first person to arrive in the morning. So when I decided to close, I wasn't worried. It was also Scotland in the summer, so even though it was six at night, it was very bright outside. It was about 6.30 when I finished what I was doing. I was in no rush and was in a great mood because I had managed to finish something so important. So I was kind of swanning around the building. As the last one out, I had to check every room to make sure there were no kids or fire hazards. And as I was checking a room at the back with glass, Perpix walkway looking into the entrance, I saw a tall man dressed in dark clothes walking in the front door. I ran to the entrance to tell them all the kids were gone already and to check the other building, but no one was there. Very strange, but I figured I must have imagined it because I was looking from the other side of the building. So I cracked on with checking the rooms. I got to the next room and I had a panicked feeling telling me to get out, run as fast as I could and not look back. I have anxiety, but I've never experienced anything like it. It was like a serial killer was chasing you. As soon as I got outside the door, I felt a wave of calm over me. I locked the door and cycled away. I actually met one of my colleagues just driving away. That's how quick I'd been. Anyway, the next morning I told the manager and basically said I wouldn't close again and I wouldn't want anyone else doing it on their own. That's when the girl who'd been doing it for months said that she had seen the figure, the same as I'd seen, every night, either at the door or preschool, and she always felt that it meant her harm. She needed the pay increase with closing and she was very level-headed, like me. We actually worked in the same room and got on for that reason. I didn't want to think about it too much. But she did what she had to do, then got out of there ASAP. During the day, we had no problems at all, so we thought that maybe the entity was fine with day-to-day -day business. But once it was done, they wanted us out of there. Either way, that feeling and the clearness with which I saw that man has made me seriously rethink ghosts. I'm not even sure if that's what it was, but honestly, that feeling was unlike anything I've ever felt before or since. Pure hatred in your heart. It was back in 2008-9. My great grandmother, GGM, passed away. Fortunately, I had the chance to see her one last time, the week before she died, and they told me that she left us with a smile. With that, I knew that seeing me was really delightful for her. So it was early in the morning, getting ready to go to the nurse before going to school with my little sister. We're both sitting at the back of the car, still a little sleepy. While I was looking outside the window, I saw a humanoid figure forming. 
I immediately recognized this face. It was my late GGM, wearing the same flowery purple blouse I've always seen her with, both hands on her stomach, looking at me and saying something. Today, I still don't know what she wanted to tell me. When it happened, I thought I was the only one who saw this. I told my mother about this the next day. She almost told me I was kind of crazy until my sister also told me she had seen the apparition. I was kind of disturbed by hearing that. That was thrilling and frightful at the same time. The only person who believed us without saying we were crazy was our grandmother, actually the GGM's daughter, because she was also seeing her in her dreams, in her prayers, and she kept talking to her for maybe five years or more until one night, my GGM didn't visit my grandmother. More recently, this didn't happen to me, but my sister last year. She was sleeping at one of her friend's places and she had a sleep paralysis. Not really sleep paralysis, it was really strange. And during that, she was wide awake. She could walk and all but not talk. Trying to wake up one of her friends, she scratched him and she also saw our GGM saying something to her, but still, we don't know what. From a cloaked man in a hood without a face, to someone with an affinity for a certain room, as well as several other sightings in between, the Holy Family Parish Church in Maine is haunted with a lot of activities. The Stillwater Montessori School rented out two rooms and utilised a good part of the building for their interests. From 1990 to 1997, I went to this school. Its layout was fairly simple. The door the school used were the ones closest to the road. It opened up to a long hallway immediately in front and the hallway to the right. This right hallway was where the school resided. This shorter hallway on the right side had a classroom that we used as a dining room, then two classrooms, Terry's and Al's. Past those three rooms was a large open coat closet. Around the corner along the adjacent wall was a large kitchen with a few tables. On the left side, a catering hall across Terry's classroom and bathroom across the coat closet. The kitchen. In the large kitchen, something lurked. This room, us students weren't allowed to play in and we used it only periodically if the church needed our normal dining hall for an event. I saw it lurking throughout the day. I always saw whatever this was through the half length window of the closed door. It looked like a man with head with long dark hair. Every time I saw him, he walked past the door. I never saw a face. Being a curious, somewhat mischievous kid, I had to check to see who else was misbehaving. Often the door would be locked. I peek through the window and see no one inside the room. When the door was unlocked, I stepped inside. I wouldn't be greeted by anyone. The room was all, always empty. Well, it always looked empty. It didn't feel empty. And it didn't sound empty. There was an authoritative energy in the room. It was strict and cold. I was a little nervous that if I stayed there for more than a minute, I'd get a good beating. The minimal moments I poked my whole body in the room, I could faintly hear dishes rattling by the sink and general mixing and cooking sounds. Sometimes we'd have to eat lunch in this room because our normal dining room was occupied. I was the only student not excited to eat my lunch here. Upon finding out would be guests in this room, I'd dread it and lose my appetite. I wasn't the only one eating there, so that made it a little bit better. I still didn't feel welcome. I'd constantly hear extra noises that didn't match students who were eating packed lunches. It was unsettling. I was always glad lunch was over when in this room. The reception hall. The school used the catering hall for potlucks throughout the year. The potlucks would include a theatre show put on by the students. The energy in this hall was somewhat ominous. Due to the kitchen and bathrooms jutting out from an otherwise large rectangular room, there were three sections of this room. The open area in front of the bathrooms, the large area overlooking the kitchen, and the smaller area that faced the entrance. This smaller area had a dark corner where the panelling was different. It looked like a booth or nook that maybe a cash register might be placed. Behind the counter, there was a weird room and closet that didn't feel right. Other than this section, light brown panelling, 
A suspended ceiling and white grey speckled vinyl adorned the room. In the centre of the longest back wall hung a large crucifix between two large windows. There were two potlucks a year. Rehearsals took place in the hall on a makeshift stage between the two windows. This is where all shows were performed. I always felt an audience of two extra people watching us. In the height of this feeling, whenever I'd look over by the kitchen wall directly across from where I was standing, I'd see a faint shadow of a man in a top hat. The man wasn't letting off a whole lot of emotions. He was just there like an overseer, sending wide bits of compassion in a slightly ominous way. Meanwhile, over by the darker panelling, an angry energy lingered behind the shadows, invisible to the eye, but I could feel it. Sorrowful anger, looming. As long as I stood clear of this dark area and never ventured there alone, I knew I was safe. Midnight Mass at Christmas. Growing up, it was a tradition to go to Midnight Mass on Christmas. My Aunt Claire, my brother Josh and I would nap in the evening and got up at 11 and head to Mass. Often the church that would host the Mass was the Holy Family Parish Church. One Christmas, while I was in high school, probably 2003, we arrived at the church and entered the church by way of the main entrance, overlooking the road. The three of us walked down the alley to sit in the pew we wanted, towards the middle of the floor. We sat down. As the Mass went on, Eventually I caught a glimpse of a man on the stage. Anger and confusion added to the overwhelming gracious peaceful Christmas atmosphere. He was wearing black cloak, the hood was over his invisible head. It just stood there for a few seconds before it just turned around and disappeared behind a red curtain. Even though this hooded figure scared me, I never mentioned it to anyone. I knew it wouldn't be able to hurt me. Usually all Catholic churches have some energy. None of the energy is anything like what looms here.